repeatedly discussed, so there's, and I think you're, you're aware of the history of it. So I, I, you know, we're trying to work with the city to sort all this out. Again, I agree with your sentiment that you don't want any misunderstandings you know, a year from now. Right, right. And the school events are all during the day, or are there some events, school events at night? Like, is there a prom or? Yeah, there are school events at night. They have um, a couple of dances for the high school, uh, for the girls, basically. They have uh, like, like a winter formal, things like that. Um, there probably would be some events at the, the for the lower school. You know, we've had a Halloween event at the villa for a number of years. Um, so yes, there are e uh, evening events, um, school events that are held on the campus and inside the villa. Okay. and the. The quarterly notice that goes out notices people for the temporary uses in the film and religious, but not school events. Is it? That's Julia, Julia Fenara. So for the school, um, we have a school calendar that is now, um, we have also a new website that um, will give the neighbors easier access to the calendar. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to include the nighttime school events on that quarterly calendar? Because I yeah, suppose uh, you'd know ahead of time. Anything that's at night, we tell the we put that on for the neighbors. We say it's a school event. Okay. And the night events, I mean, those aren't things that suddenly come up last minute. Those are scheduled well in advance. Right. So there'll be no night events that aren't on the calendar. Correct. Like we have a back to school night this week. That's coming up. Yeah. Our concern is to rebuild uh, uh, trust and confidence with the neighbors that they understand what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and they're not surprised. It's when they get surprised, I think it undermines the sense of you know what's being told to them is true. Right. We understand that. Yeah. Um, for what sports is Alverno the home school? that they play at, at your school? The only ones that don't are ones that require a gym. So it's volleyball and basketball. W where do you play volleyball, outside? Yeah, we have to play, no, we can't, girls can't, the high school has to be in a gym. Yeah, so, so what, the lower school can play sport, outside. The, the, so are, you're in the CIF, correct? Correct. So what CIF sports do you play at your facility? At our facility, it's soccer, softball, um, and no, but that's no, not CIF. That's not <coughs> CIF no. And so um, for the lower school, for CYO, um, which are the younger kids, right. they play. Um, but those are all, uh, like there's football, volleyball, basketball. That's all played outside. So, so CIF issues you a schedule for your games where you are the home school. Yes, those are subject to change. They are subject to change, but that, but, but at least at the beginning of the season, you kind of know when. Yeah, those yeah, we have are. those on the calendar. Yeah, you All have of those our on athletic, the calendar. Yes. And <clears throat> do you foresee a problem if you are having um, home games, if you are hosting a, 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 a game against another school, in either softball or soccer, that creating a, w with another event that you're already having on campus? No, um, because those are usually right after school. So um, we may have a small thing going on, um, like a play practice, not a play, but a play practice going, I mean, just school things going on. Do you field both varsity and JV teams or just varsity? Um, for soccer, it's just varsity. For both softball and soccer, just varsity. Just, just varsity. So you don't play two games, you only play one. Correct. Okay, and and if you're following CIF schedule, then you you're you begin at like two thirty, and then it's over way we, before. We dark. have no lights, so we have to be out by dark. Right. Yeah. Okay. There's right. a sundown rule. Okay. Um. All right. But the, you don't perceive your CIF uh, commitment as being in conflict with the other events that you're holding on campus. I'm looking at it from an intensity of use. Right. If you the, have multiple things going on on your campus, you're going to create an intensity of use that's going to impact your neighbors. Right. I understand. But the only intensity of use would be the, um, um, there would be two athletic games going on at the same time. So there could be um, a basketball game going on for the lower school up in the parking lot, and there could be a soccer game being played 
at the in the lower school parking lot for the school high school because we have ever, CIF and CYO. Right. Do you ever consider having any of those uh, sporting events without um, without obser observers? In other words, without in other words, just holding the event with the athletes and not with any no. anyone. No, you don't. Sure. Do that. I mean, this is for parents to be there to okay. be well, around their kids. I mean, <laughs> I mean but you, um, when you talk about a change of schedule, that's something you know we could possibly try and schedule. But we have. Well, it's up against. If it's up against another event at your uh, at your facility, yeah, then something's got to give. Well, I understand that, right? But so, for example, we're gonna if we're not playing a game and they're having a basketball team or basketball game up at the upper school, a lower school in the parking lot, we're still going to have soccer practice. Now, we're not going to have any spectators. We're not talking about practice, because right? practice is usually not accompanied by a lot of uh, um, observers and Correct. people who are cheering. Right. But, but games have fans. Right. Now, you could have games that you say, well, we're not going to have any fans today because we've got too much other things going on on campus. Right. But, but we really don't ever have... <laughs> I wish we did, but we don't really have that many fans that are there. We, I mean, we have a, we, we it's not, it's not like a football game coming to, uh, you know, to see us play softball or to see us play soccer. Okay, we're just, it's, we're, we're looking at intensity of use. I understand, I understand. Mm -hmm. How many of uh, the religious events do you have a year? Well, we have a lot, but you mean on the, Sundays? The religious special events that are... Oh, the special yeah, Sunday events? Special Sunday events. I think in the last two years, we've, when we counted, it was like five, eight, three, within a two-year period. Three, about three a year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's not really a lot. And, and they take place in the chapel? They, um, it depends on the size, but usually because... If somebody wants to use the villa, it's because they have to have more guests. So, like for example, a memorial service that they would have out by the um, villa pond, because they'd have mass and the memorial service, and then like a small reception afterwards, okay. or a baptism. Those are the types of things. Anybody else have any other questions? No, no, none for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we can go to public comment then. And Chair Dennison, if I could uh, interrupt for one moment. At the, be at the beginning of the meeting, when we asked for public comment for items not on the agenda, we were not under broadcast. Um, so uh, Deb Sheridan's comment was not captured. Uh, I will leave the decision up to you whether or not uh, she would like to come up and have her make public comment again on that same item or defer to staff's notes that were taken. Okay. Um, maybe we'll do that between the two hearings. Um, at this time, any person may address the Planning Commission concerning this particular agenda item. The Commission welcomes your attendance and participation. When addressing the Commission, please begin by providing your name and address for the record. Please keep comments to no more than three minutes to assure an orderly meeting. Do we have anybody who has turned in comment cards? I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. Uh, Ken Fancing, Ms. Shalinda. Uh, Kristen Stevens, Grandview Avenue. Keith Stevens, Grand West Grandview. Hi, Keith Stevens, <coughs> 717 West Grandview. And so much to say, but my wife and I have been attending planning commission and city council meetings related to Alberno since 2005. During that time, there's been a const consistent showing of other residents unhappy with villa events, noise, and traffic created by them. Two lawsuits have been settled between the villa and residents in the last 25 years. So the ongoing nuisance and commercial business of an otherwise quiet R1 neighborhood is real. Specifically, on the CUP, 
for the villa regarding noise in 2009 or earlier residents requested the doors and windows of the villa be kept closed when amplified music was playing closed doors and windows efficiently contain inside noise to the premises villa claimed open doors were needed for ventilation so air conditioning was proposed to minimize noise and enhance participants comfort in the September 2009 Villa TUP renewal recommended conditions 1.4 central air conditioning shall be installed inside the villa pursuant to a mutually agreeable timetable between Alverno and the neighbors. In 13 years the air conditioning was never installed just due to ongoing excuses, most recent of which is Mr. Farson claims he does not know who the neighbors are to negotiate with. The commission cannot accept this reasoning. The names and addresses of neighbors like me who speak at at these meetings are available. Attendees of qu quarterly Alverno meetings are required to register. The information has always been there. Uh, we attend many of the quarterly Alverno meetings and the subject of air conditioning was not a negotiation but rather an explanation that it wasn't going to happen and the doors will stay open. I request the Planning Commission mandate immediate installation of air conditioning in the large downtown large downstairs areas of the villa with central or mini split units and remove the outside dancing from allowed conditions. <coughs> In Mr. Farsing's July 21st presentation, he noted a list of architectural, historical, religious, and nonprofit designations they have voluntarily sought and have been granted by authorities. Each designation has its own related law or code offering tax incentives or operational exceptions in the residential area. To quote Mr. Farsing, preservation ordinance codifies incentives for financial preservation, enhancement of the attraction to visitors, stimulating commerce and stabilizing neighborhoods. Um, the villa offers no charge to access events, which we've just been talking about. Neighbors are expected to bear the repeated nuisance of weekend noise, and traffic of paid and free events in addition to all school activities. This is not stabilizing behavior. It is emotionally stressful limitation on our outdoor enjoyment and a cost reducing disclosure on a home sales contract. Uh, regarding the sound study, where did my paragraph go? Thank you. All right. Lisa Paleo, West Highland Avenue. Good evening, Lisa Paleo, 672 West Highland. Um, I believe that the City Council may uh, choose the end time at 10 o'clock for the events, and I'd like the Planning Commission to put off that vote until the City Council makes that decision. Um, in terms of Sunday events, I have a feeling that they're, they're going to say everything is a religious event. So um, I think it's important to define what a religious event is and how will the city determine if a particular event is actually religious. <clears throat> uh, baptisms, although religious in nature, are huge parties, just like weddings. And technically, you can, you can say that a wedding is, is a religious celebration. So I think that allowing Sunday religious events is a huge impact on neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Cynthia Swanko Wilson. If you want to go back. If you want to go back. Yeah. Kristen Stevens. Kristen Stevens. Good evening. Um, my name is Cynthia Swanka. I live at 239 Wilson Street. And I reviewed the conditions. I don't know if we want to pull them up. But I, on the text on paragraph number 8, for me it was page 30 on the PDF. I don't know if it's page 30. For, it's right above temporary uses under the general conditions. Um, I don't think that text accurately reflects what the commission discussed and agreed to on July 21 regarding meeting annually. So Chair Dennison stated that the review should be, quote, 
annual unless otherwise designated. And Vice Chair Hutt and Commissioner Spears agreed, and I have the timestamp for that. So I suggest the following corrections to number eight. So number eight in the first sentence says planning commission may, and I think that should be changed to will or shall. And on number eight again, sentences six and seven, I think it should really say what Chair Dennison had said, which was planning commission will or shall review annually unless otherwise designated. That's all I had to say, but those, that's the one thing I noticed. Thank you. Thank you. General conditions. Kristen Stevens, West Grandview Avenue. Good evening. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I hope you all got my letter. I um, discussed the noise studies. They need to be invalidated, and I'm hoping that we do not proceed with the CUP for either of them because they're just totally skewed, and I knew they were. I just couldn't figure out how to say it. And I, I put it all in the letter. Um, so I'm not the only neighbor. Yes, I paid for it, but it was because I knew you wouldn't believe me. You would just think it's not acceptable. You guys have been talking about noise and noise on the parking lot, I guess will come up more with the school, but it isn't just games and these kids are loud. It can be a practice. It still carries up to our home. Oh, well, actually that's a, that's a playground. I, this, it's, Seriously, that's not annoying. Uh, for two, it, it was playing up until six o'clock last week. Sun doesn't go down until 7.30. Um, that's just incredibly annoying. So, it's really difficult to provide these to you. There really needs to be a better way because I have dozens of recordings that we've taken. Either the kids just playing on the playground and that's even farther down. It's hardscape, there's absolutely no mitigation, noise mitigation. We've brought these concerns to Alverno. We see nothing in here that addresses any of the concerns. The meetings, the minutes, um, they're written for their version. They say things that I didn't. They left key comments out our concerns, we showed up to them and instead of what we get is they find ways to dismiss them and fight them instead of trying to incorporate what we're saying. Uh, we don't want to change the number of rental events. We're not wanting to trade four days for 15 days more of filming. I think that's ridiculous. It's an 8 a.m. start, does that mean setup? Does that mean event? Because sometimes it'll say it's an 8 a.m., but we see people on campus early or we hear them. There are people still there till 1, 2, midnight. I've got, we've got recordings, we've been woken up. Our bedroom's over by this place. There is something under the nose, noise code about not affecting sleeping facilities. Keep the filming numbers the same. Generator at 100 feet or 150 feet is too close. Our house is 100 feet away from the property plane. Uh, it should be like 250 feet closer to the elevator or to the villa. These meetings were only decided to go to two because we were told or we were duped that we could change them back if there was more going on. We agreed to two meetings because there was no construction, there was very little weddings, and nothing else was going on. That has not returned. If you absolutely have to only do two, I think we should meet in something like October and April, not at the beginning of the school year in the very end when everybody's very busy and there's a lot of time in between. 
frankly, I feel like we've been to a lot of these meetings and it's been BS. We've shown up, we've, we've talked about the same things, the noise at the wedding, the dancing on the terraces. It's absurd. Um, Thank you. I hope you can click on the items that I had. Okay. It's just unfortunate that we don't have as much time to speak on this and present 800 pages. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this agenda item? Okay. All right, then we will bring it back for deliberation. Who would like to start? Well, do we want to just go through the conditions, flip through and make changes as we go? Yep. Let's do that. All right. On the general conditions, did anybody have anything they wanted to change with any of them as presented? Well, we got comments on number eight, and um, and, and I, I think that in the first line, the may being changed to shall makes sense to me because we're saying we're going to have a meeting. We're not maybe going to have a meeting. So I'd like to change that one to shall. I'm okay with that. Anybody object? Yeah. No, I'm fine with that. And then the, the next part where it says the, we'll have determined the Grant flexibility to determine time frame review and unless otherwise determines if one may. I think that one should be shall too, because if we we can change it, but if we decide not to change it, we should have one once a year. And then if we decide, well, we need one every six months or every two years, whatever, we can change. But the, I think the default is is uh, one one year. So change those two mays to shall. And I thought that we had discussed doing this reviewing this annually and it, it just says one year well it's a, in the later it says every uh, other year um, no, it says on the first anniversary yeah. and every other year thereafter so yeah. okay well every other year meaning we'd go two years shouldn't it read every year thereafter yes let's take out the other I, I think that makes sense Everyone's on. Yeah. yeah. If things are going smoothly, we can just elect to that. Yeah, but uh, but given the the ongoing contention in the neighborhood, I think w we need to monitor it to make sure that there's progress. Okay. Any other changes in the general conditions? Let's move on to temporary uses. Uh, the first comment I had was at 2.2. Yeah, I do too, 2.2. Uh, I, I want to go back to 1.4. So the, the kind it goes back to my questions about concurrent events. And um, I, you know, I've been, I've been at schools where w we've held uh, athletic events without uh, visitors, without, so it's just the, the athletes with each other. And, if, and it may be a, a, a solution if they're having more than one event on the same day at the school that is generating noise. If they're going to have a CIF game, uh, there is provision in the CIF language that you can have one without, um, uh, without visitors, without, without people coming to observe and without the fans in the, f in the stands because it's just for whatever reason. Usually, in, in, unfortunately, in the schools where I was at, it was for safety. 
But the other thing is it could be for noise. But we could give them that option. Because I could easily see that the, there would be a conflict between a, a game that is scheduled by CIF and something that's happening on their campus. That's reasonable. I think that's reasonable. Sounds good. Everybody okay? What what edit are you proposing? So. When, when it says prohibit any concurrent events at the field and multi-purpose building with the exception of school related events which do not include additional visitors so I guess the the, the, the point that they that that uh, CIF scheduled events would be held without visitors namely people to come and cheer their fans visitors slash fans I guess so that the game could go on and then they, they could have that kind of concurrent event Mm -hmm. So the visiting team would not be visitors? No, the visiting team would still come, but only the athletes and not the cheerleaders and the parents and the marching band and all that malarkey. In other words, the athletes come and they compete and that's that. Does that need, does that need to be clarified? Or? I, I trust staff could come up with the, with the language for that. Ask. Is that is that an edit that you would be willing to accept? We have no idea what you're proposing. Okay, I, I think that the concern is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the way the language is proposed, it said that there's no concurrent events, and it was described that there would be concurrent events, and so I think we're trying to find a way okay. to allow concurrent yeah. events. Yeah, we, we, we think we should come up. We'll come up. Yeah. yeah, we want to make sure we're clear on it. So let, let's say we've got. Um, a volleyball game for the lower school up in the Mitchell Linda parking lot and there is a girls so uh, soccer game down in the athletic field correct those so are concurrent events those are concurrent events so what what exactly are you proposing in terms of how, so how would that be regulated so uh, rather than say that you could not have a concurrent event if your visiting team comes they come with only athletes and not the cheerleaders and not all the other visitors that make the noise so it would be two, it'd be two athletic teams as opposed to teams with all the accoutrements. So it's not just C, it's, we could make a choice between CIF and CYO, which is the Catholic Youth Organization. That's the lower school. And they n normally don't come with a lot of extra people. Right. But the CIF can. But, but just realize that we're, a, we're girls, I mean, we're only playing against girls' leagues. We don't play in any public schools. We've never seen a marching band in our lives, <laughs> and I and really we have no cheerleaders because there's no cheerleaders for girls' schools. So there, there's these are very small schools that we play. So there's, I mean, it, we're just talking about a very. When I say literally, I, I mean I'm not so trying to, to say anything bad about the school, or I mean about the size of the school. But we're a small school, and we pay, we play small schools. That's so our league. Here's a practical example. So let's say. The lower school is playing St. Rita's in volleyball. So you're saying we could make a choice that we really want no one from St. Rita's, none of the parents to come over to look, watch their kids play? Well, if they're going to make noise, then we can go, we can always go back to say no concurrent, no, I mean, we're, we're giving you uh, no concurrent events. We can do that if you want. I'm trying to yeah, find out. No, I think, I think the point that we're trying, to, the point I'd like to make is that when you look at the noise studies, we're not violating your noise ordinance. So you're, you're trying to solve a problem in our mind that we're not violating. Okay, but we've just heard from the public where they played a tape of, it sounded yeah, but like. That, that's, not, that's not admissible. I mean, if basically there's a violation of the noise code, I think the last time you talked about it, the city attorney was working with the code enforcement folks to figure out how you enforce the noise code. But in my experience, basically you've got to do the noise monitoring. And if there's basically an issue, then you know if we can't correct it we end up in litigation with the, between the city and the, the school I mean okay, then we can go back to no concurrent events that's fine I, I we feel that's unrealistic okay thank you we'll take this back for deliberation then What's that? no we're no we're he's talking about the school and the villa so they've got 
basically they're talking about everything. Yeah. So we'll have a second chance to talk about the school. So anything between 1.4 and 2.2? No, I got 2.2. Nope. All right, 2.2. I'd like to clarify that 8 a.m. is the beginning of setup. Yeah, I'd like and to put a parenthetical then, after begin. This is including setup and all other activities. Yeah. And then the 10 p.m. Uh, would be uh, the end of breakdown, is it because I think that would be in line with the city code for other events, similar events. Yeah, so to clarify that, the code as it's written today and was recently passed by city council is at 10 p.m. The, 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 co the code wasn't passed. Uh, All right. The, the code is going to be brought back to the city council for their consideration. Uh, but the code is written currently to say 10 p.m. 10 p.m. is when the breakdown has to be finished and everything. Correct. Okay. The gates are to be closed. Yes. Okay. So I would think it should be in line with the rest of the city. Okay. At 10 p.m.? Yes. Yeah, it's 10 p.m. Yeah, I guess so. I, I think some of the breakdown is variable, but I think, I don't know. I think they should have some allowance to get things finished up, but I know how that flitters out into. Uh, well, I think it goes to fairness across the town. Um, and I suspect we've had less complaints randomly across the town than we've had at this site. So if any place should be held to a lower time, it should be this one. And so. That's assuming that the city council is going to come up with that, but I, I guess that's reasonable. I mean. The noise has been a big issue in the neighborhood, so maybe making everything stop at 10 o'clock will mitigate some of the uh, uh, bad blood that's been happening somewhat. It also makes it consistent, so it's, it's, okay. it's more likely to be regularly enforced. Okay. All right, so 10 o'clock, this is the edit there? Yes, set up to break down. Well, I, I don't think it needs to say that I think what if there's a hard time it's that's everything has to be done by then right that's that's the way the Correct. Yeah. okay I think 3.7.1 was my next um I have a 3.4 okay go ahead I, I was gonna have a question on 3.5 okay. um I think I think from everything I've heard is that the dancing should be inside with the doors and windows closed and there should be air conditioning. I'm, which is not what this says. This allows dancing on the terrace with the music inside, which presumes the doors are open. I, I think that when we spoke at our last meeting, we decided that as long as the speakers stayed inside, that the dancing was okay outside, mm -hmm. if I recall correctly. That was the, that's yes. correct, yeah. And regardless of where the dancing happening, it, the music and all the noise is still governed by the overarching code. So is the history that Mr. Stevens told us about uh, over the years of them being required to put in air conditioning and not, is that, did that not happen or what's going on? That has not happened as of yet and that was one of the conditions that the Planning Commission determined that that shouldn't be under the purview of the Planning Commission installation time frame for AC. 
But we we did edit 3.6 to talk about mitigation measure, measures for sound dampening that would be a mutually agreeable between the, the Alverno and the city so that there wasn't this ambiguity about having to negotiate with, with neighbors, which apparently for some reason was difficult to do. So it was just the city that could do that. So I, I think the big issue to me is I don't have any problem with the dancing on the terrace. It seems perfectly fine. The issue is if you have your amplified music inside, but then you have all the doors open and you have the speakers, you know, pointing out to the terrace, it, it, you don't have the music outside, but the, the music travels outside. And so I think the, the concept is, and when we talked about this at the last meeting, it was, you know, people could dance just sort of with the residue of the music, but not like the music blaring outside. So I don't know how we make sure 3.6 gets us there, but it, the concept is supposed to be that the, mu the music, the amplified music stays inside. And you can't do that perfectly, and so some of it's gonna come out, but you don't want you know, big speakers going towards open doors. That, that's, that's or, or outside on the terrace, which yeah. is what I've seen. Well. It's specifically banned to be outside on the terrace. Right. But if all music shall be played indoors. But if you have that open and it's pointing out, and so maybe we say, um, maybe we try to modify 3.4 and say all music shall be played indoors. And then the, the, I, I don't know how to say this. But the concept is that it's, it's meant to be directed indoors and not outdoors. So the loud music will be happening at presumably all 26 events and uh, an unknown number of school events. So I was going to add that the, I believe the reason for opening the windows and doors was, was for ventilation uh, because you have up to 200 people inside of the villa and some nights can be hot. So I, th I think that was the reason uh, I just wanted to add that additional factor for the consideration of the commission. I just don't know why it was never done. I mean, if this noise has been an issue and they determined that the do windows and doors have to be closed and an air conditioner has to be installed and this has been going on for 10 years now or whatever. Com Commissioner Dallas, you can always ask the applicant as well. Okay. Let's do that. I appreciate the opportunity to clarify the statement that I made that I don't know the neighbors um, it's taken out of context. The um, condition on a temporary use permit basically um, indicated that the air conditioning should be um, installed on a mutually agreeable timetable with the neighbors. We mail notices to over 190 neighbors and the point I was trying to make is it's hard to get 190 people together to make a decision. We did not understand that condition when it was imposed by the city 10 years ago. So it was, you know, we, we had a group that we originally worked with uh, that was a, basically they represented themselves that they were, they were representing all 190 neighbors. And when we, after the temporary use permit was approved, we went back to contact them and they didn't want to meet. They're, we couldn't find them, they, they moved or whatever. So at that point in time, we just, you know, there's, there's no, really no way to, to reach a consensus on what to do. And it, it also said that we would install central air, which to us didn't make a whole lot of sense in a building of that size to install central air, when if the situation really that we should be installing, you know, if we installed air conditioning, it would be installed um, basically on the ground floor in the areas where we have people congregating. And the commission's discussion was, well, if you install air conditioning and you leave the doors open so people can go in and out between the terrace, you're basically defeating your purpose of having the, the air conditioning installed. So, you know, I, you know, unfortunately you weren't here for the, the meeting where we went through that, but we also had the noise consultant walk through 
the noise monitoring that was done on two villa rental events. There was a quinceanera and there was a wedding. And uh, Mr. Sabatala basically went through all of the city's noise requirements and looked at the um, noise measurements for those events and did not find that we had any violations. I believe um, Chair Dennison wants to talk about those standards in 3.7 and uh, Mr. Savatal is here to answer any questions you would have. So again, we need to leave some doors open. We've got exiting requirements from the fire department. Um, the condition that we came up with basically is to work with the staff on some type of sound baffling that would be installed in front of the windows you know, to try to mitigate. But again, we we're, the, the noise is not violating your ordinance and that's kind of where we're, we're wondering about um, you know, if we're not violating the ordinance, then why are we doing all of these additional costly measures? So that's been our concern. Okay. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. I, I'm, I just want to say one thing is that we can't just say do anything as long as it doesn't violate um, performance standards because that sets us up for a, um, a real hardship on code enforcement. So one of the reasons why we have conditions on uses is because through experience we've seen in the past that certain uses cause certain issues and we're more likely to get an outcome that's going to be acceptable to, to, to the neighbors and to other parties without having to rely on difficult code enforcement and have battles and squabbles or whatnot. And so I, I, I I understand the applicant's point about saying, well, look, let's not over-regulate us if we're, if we're not causing a problem, and I agree with that, but if there are things that, that we've heard from neighbors that are problematic or we've seen on other projects that we know to be problematic, you know, those are the kind of things that it's reasonable for us to limit. Um, and so if we have, if we've seen in the past that multiple events of the same day cause problems, Maybe it's not just noise, maybe it's traffic, maybe there's parking, maybe there's other issues, right? Th these are the kind of things that it makes sense for us to try to regulate and not just fall back on code enforcement because in the past, not just on this project, but in other projects, we've seen that code enforcement alone is not the solution. So I, I, I just want to make sure we're not going to the point where we think we're going to solve everything through code enforcement because that hasn't worked in many, many places throughout the city over over time. I just want to comment, you do have the requirement for the event monitor, and that's something that we've agreed to. We think that's important to have the event, independent event monitor. And I think what's critical is what information we give to that event monitor, what are they supposed to be monitoring? And uh, that's where, you know, again, what, when they go, when they basically take the ambient reading, what is it? When the dance music starts, What's the reading? Where do they stand? If the police come up because of a complaint, what standard are they looking at? I think those are all very legitimate questions, and that shows that we have the intent to try to comply with your city codes. Right. We don't necessarily want to go to code enforcement. We understand that's a, a difficult process and can be very expensive. We're not trying to be litigious, but we need rules for the road where the neighbors understand and the school understands kind of what are the limits. Yeah, I agree, and yeah. I think the check, the concept of the checklist for the event monitor is something we've discussed, and I think is a really good idea. Right. Because that will help make, a, as you said, a roadmap for right. compliance. Okay, so I, I suggest that we append to the end of section 3.4, which says all music shall be played indoors within the villa, say, with all amplified music speakers oriented to project music indoors rather than outside. So at least we, we gather the concept that you're, we're supposed to be focusing the music inside. And then when the city and, and um, Alverno discuss section 3.6 on sound mitigation, it, it sort of gives a little bit more guidance as to what we're after. And it, it, that may have to be added then to the checklist because the monitor, when they walk around, will see that the speakers are pointed inside as opposed to out. That's a great idea. Are the speakers are pointed inside. Are the speakers inside? Yeah, the speakers have and to be inside. It says all music shall be played indoors. Okay. 
and theoretically, if they're breaking down and out of there by 10, the music should stop 9.30-ish at the latest? It's, yeah, the music in section 2.2 says all music ending no later than 9.30. I, I'm sorry, just one more question to go yeah. back. Um, why were the neighbors supposed to consult on the air conditioning? I'm just trying to understand the whole history of this thing here. I mean, seriously. I don't I mean, have an answer for that what one. What was the point of that? I wasn't around for that one, so I... 12 years ago. Does anybody know who was here for that? Okay, because that just right. seems... I remember, I remember the discussion, but uh, it was... Like between, an impossible situation. It was situation. mostly between Alverno and the neighbors. Okay. I think it was offered as a mitigation, a measure of mitigation. Okay. And just in case you come back to the air conditioning at a later time, the technology has changed such that mini splits would solve this much easier in a historical building than I, a central. Yeah, central. I think. Yeah. I nope. think the inclusion of central caused a, a big stumbling block. Yeah. Okay. Well, but. I guess now that the city's going to be involved in those conversations, they won't have confusion for 10 years without seeking clarification. That's right, they can find this the city. Around. 12 years <laughs> without <laughs> seeking clarification yeah, about and, questions. And right? the great thing is we're gonna have an annual review, yeah, yeah. and so one of the questions we can ask is, how are we doing on section 3.6? Right. And rather than waiting 12 years for clarification, <laughs> they can wait 12 months. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, on section 3.5, we have the 150 feet for uh, the generators from residential properties, and we had comments about increasing that buffer. I don't know w w how realistic that is, or, or I'm not really a generator noise expert, so, but I did want to have a discussion about that. So, is it to the I mean, is it to the curb uh, across the street from Grand on Grandview, or I mean? So, I, I... Is it to the property line? Yeah, I assume... In it's just residential property, yeah, so I'm Property, should we just say line, or to clarify what we're measuring to? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the goal, I, I, what I'm assuming is that, that the generators are placed in such a way that they don't interfere with, that the neighbors are not annoyed by loud diesel. And there may be ways of doing that within 150 feet, I mean, I think there's... What if we measure 150 feet from the Alberno property line? You basically gain the, the amount of the road then. Yeah, that's... It's this also is much clearer, I think. Yes, it's much easier to, to measure that. Yeah. yeah. And they that would know where inside. on their property that, that is. Yeah. Okay. So could we say a minimum of 150 feet from the pr the what are we calling, AHA campus property line? Is there, how wide across is it? Wide across what? I mean, it's only 270 feet, there's nowhere they could do that. Oh, the property? Well, how wide is the 13 acres? I think it's, it's pretty wide. I'd have to look at the basket plan. Okay, well, why don't you take a look and Let's move on and we'll move on while they take a look at that. Yeah. Yes. Um, We're okay with 150 feet from the property line. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Good. Okay. Great. I mean, this came from your film permit ordinance. I believe that the city council is considering. They came up with 150 feet from a residence. Is that? I think that's correct, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so. Uh, for a generic permit, I can understand why they do that. But for this, it, you're surrounded by residential, right? So it just yeah. makes more sense to go property line. Yep. I think that's a good solution. And Mr. Farfseen, any idea how wide that campus is? Oh, God. <laughs> I'll pull the plans up and take a look. It's a pretty, pretty big campus. Yeah, okay. I, I don't think that the 150 feet will be a problem. You can look at the residential properties on the bottom of the parking map and get a sense of it. Yeah. Okay. You want to discuss 3 7? Uh, yes. Let, let's talk about three, section seven, six 3 7. Feet wide. So 3.7.1, does this mean that 
at no time should there be any noise in excess of 70 dBA at the property line? That's the baseline, yeah. No, so a baseline. What do you mean a baseline? Yeah, the baseline is uh, here is elsewhere. So it says, and I'm fogging up here. Sorry. The vent noise limits at the Averno property line should not exceed the following noise limit. The existing language. Yeah. So it says if the event noise does exceed the local ambient but it's not greater than 70 dBA, uh, and that would be such as the villa, then noise level should be limited to, and that's where the uh, 84 dBA for a one minute interval per hour came into play. So that's not what 3.7.1 reads though. And so that's why I'm getting confused. So what is the intent of 3.7.1? So it, it's saying it cannot exceed 70 uh, dBA at the property line, but if it does, it could go up to 84 dBA for one minute intervals per hour. So w what, what then is the purpose of the ambient? So is that 6 dBA above, 70 dBA above the ambient or just 70 dBA Period. It's above the ambient. Then we should probably include above the ambient in there. Is that correct? I don't. I mean, I. I, I I'm not a. I think 70 dBA is actually the ambient noise level. I don't think it's. Hi. Hi. I'm the noise expert. Perhaps I could. Yeah. Offer some some. Come on down. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, it's 70 dBA. Period. So. Uh, at or up to the property line for a 371, meaning the noise monitors that Alberto Heights has, walk, oh, I'm so sorry, walking around the campus can measure within the campus up to the property line, and that would be 70 dBA, regardless of the ambient, as long as they're not exceeding 70 dBA. So That's that means like at the villa? Up to the property line. So at the villa, it's gonna get louder, right? And as you walk away, and you're still within campus grounds, it will get quieter. As long as you're up to the property line and it's not exceeding 70, then you're still within noise limits. Okay. And so we should change the up to. Yeah, and the within. Because it, yeah. I read it within the campus up to the property line. I read that to mean everywhere on the campus, yeah. you can't go over 70. So at the property line would be, would okay. be more acceptable. Correct. So what is the purpose of measuring the ambient? Good question. There are times in which, before an event starts, the ambient may be low. Let's say it's 55, 60, there's not a lot of traffic going on, and then an event starts. A resident may perceive 70 dBA as being excessively loud because right before the ambient, right before the event started, the neighborhood was quiet, and thus, you'll get noise complaints, but it'll still be within the 70 dBA, so we've allotted for two aspects of it. One, if you're still within 70, then you're fine, right, 371. If you're slightly above 70, you've got 84 dB at one minute. At any point after 10 o'clock, those noise levels should be relatively gone, and that's really 372A, which is the 6 dBA over ambient, because that's really where the the event's noise needs to go away. At that so point. they, so th there's going to be a wedding, and the monitor shows up at scene, takes a reading of the ambient at the property line, mm -hmm. and it's whatever it is. It's whatever it is. And during the event, they monitor it and they watch it go up and down, and it should not go above seventy, or <laughs> if it goes above seventy, only in, in for one minute or whatever. Correct. And then at ten o'clock, everybody leaves. The, the monitor will take another reading and it should be back to ambient or lower. That is correct. Okay, we should probably capture that in the yep. checklist. Yeah. Um, you guys did an extensive study. How much of the time was 
the ambient, how close was the ambient to 70? Rarely. For the most part, that neighborhood is dominated by traffic noise. So more traffic, more noise, irrespective of what the noise levels were coming from Alverno. When the noise levels get, or sorry, when the time gets closer to 10 o'clock, you see a significant dip in noise levels as people are packing up and they're leaving and then the ambient goes back to pretty quiet. It's a, it's a fairly quiet neighborhood and is really dominated by just the traffic noise for the most part. And, and what's, you took ambient noise with the traffic, right? So what, what was good. the ambient noise level with the traffic? I'm trying to get a, a, a sure. order of magnitude oh, of the of delta between uh, ambient and it, noise and... So I don't want to misquote myself because a lot of that, that information was presented at the last meeting as well. So I'm going to give a range if you don't mind. And it was anywhere from 50 to 65, sort of the, as the traffic ebbs and flows. But if it ebbs and flows, and we're taking one ambient test right at the beginning, d d does that work? Well, it doesn't matter because if we if we say you can only exceed ambient by such and such, but the but you can really go up to seventy, then the ambient readings don't mean anything. And you're already shut down at ten o'clock, so any noise at ten o'clock is a violation. So because you should already be out. Is and are the the other thing is if we're only talking about measuring at the property line, the event monitor can't do a, a noise measurement except when they go to the property line, right? So they can't like be at the event and take a measurement. I they, mean, they can, but it's not something that we have put in the code. So they would have to go, walk to the property line, take a measurement, and then. Back. But when you think about it, that's where the problem starts. Yeah, no, I understand. It's just you, you think the event monitor is probably going to monitor the event, like not monitor the property line? I don't know. Oh, I, I didn't. I yeah. thought they were going to monitor the property line. Yeah, that's where so the problems too. are going to be. Okay. Yeah, and, and look at because it, that's where the traffic is and the light pollution and all the other stuff. That is the intent is that the, the monitors are walking around the property link. As you've said, that's where the noise needs yeah. to be monitored the most. I Sir? think if we're going with the monitoring concept for the first year, we should have a very specific program for the monitor to follow. You know, time you're here, time you're there. And that helps us also comparing one event to another. You know, so you're actually certain spots, certain times, and it's it's data that can be, you know, processed and compared over, the, you know, several events throughout the year. And so. so like a watchman that goes around and goes to certain areas and gets, and uh, I guess what I'm, w w th there are certain places on the perimeter of the property where there is more sensitivity to the noise that's coming off the property and it may be helpful to measure at that location because that seems to be where the, I mean, there could be because trees or other things are blocking the noise in other places, but at certain places, people are either the neighbors are very sensitive to the issue or there's nothing mitigating the, the, the transfer of noise. And it may be open we door. ask them to say, well, you know, we seem to have a problem at this location. Can you make sure you measure there? Right, or yeah. it could be where one of the doors is open and it's sort of the music yeah. goes right there. So. <laughs> I'm guessing that the measurement that would be taken is not setting up a tripod and stepping back out of an acoustical range, but it's more like walking around with a cell phone. No, it is not walking around with a cell phone. It is walking around with a, a sound level meter. Uh, sorry, but what I mean is it's a constant reading. You don't push a button and get a reading there. You can take a constant reading, and the sound meter will tell you the highest level of that reading at that time. So you could start on one corner and in three minutes later, you're at the top of the property and you've measured that entire, that entire side. It is a, it is a continuous measurement. Like a VU correct. meter or is it just a, a, just, just a digital readout? Say, say, say the question one more time. Like say. a VU meter where in the old days that the... Oh would, man, I've used those. Hey, yes. they're not that old. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm very old and hey, I used to use the them. the ageist so. here. <laughs> those are pretty cool. It is a, it's a digital meter 
with a continuous readout. Oh, okay. So right. the idea is that the noise monitor, yeah. sorry, sorry the, the concept, the noise monitor stands for at least a minute and watches the, the meter. I think the concern, as I understand it, is someone's going to walk by and go, great, and then just walk away. No, that's not what's happening. They're standing, waiting, and looking at the monitor as it's going up and down to be able to establish what that noise level is in that time frame. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. City Attorney, the 70 dBA is a number that was somewhere that is somewhere else in our code, and that's where we, that number came from. Is that correct? I'm going to defer to the director on this one. <laughs> That is correct, yes. Okay, so that, that's a pre-existing, that wasn't just uh, randomly. Okay. I, I still don't understand the difference between 3.7.2b and 3.7.1. They seem pretty redundant to me. I don't understand 3.72a. That's in our code. That's the ambient, mm -hmm. which... We if, I understand, if I understand it correctly, 3.71 is not on Alverno's property. It's just the property line. And 3.7.2 is actually on the campus. So you're Maybe saying that that's saying if the event is at the villa, that it should stay no higher than 70 decibels, except for an occasional one minute at 84. Yeah. So for hours. maybe for simplistic, we just make it 70 dB at the property line. Right. I thought I thought that was the edit. That's what I had written down. Uh, but I mean, like the language I within the Alverno campus for 3.7.1? Yeah, the property line. Yeah, but I don't understand what we get in 3.7.2. Right. I, I, guess, I, I, I would the, just the issue is whether we want this like one minute of hooting and hollering. No. Nope. Because the, uh, we saw that picture where there was that, those exceptions. I, I, I guess I wonder also if we want a different level at 9.30. The music cuts off at 9.30. We've, we've heard that ambient is lower and that's supposed to be quieter by then. Maybe we say 70 until 9.30 and 60 be less than that. At well, 64 at, at, uh, at 9.30. My understanding was that the 70 is the code citywide yeah. till 10 o'clock? And the six, about six. Well, but, but it doesn't say 10 o'clock. It doesn't give a time frame. Okay. At no time can you exceed 70 dBA. Above. Um, but the 6 dBA above, I mean, there's, it's an enforcement nightmare in my right. opinion. Right, and that's why I'm trying to say, look, the sound level is supposed to go down later at night, right? The music's supposed to cut off. An approximation of that ambient is to say it's 70 until 9.30, and then from 9.30 to 10, it's a lower level. I'm okay with that. How do we write it? <coughs> we say the noise limit at the property line can't exceed 70 dBA uh, before, se before 9.30, and from 9.30 to 10, it can't exceed 64 dBA. And and Vice Chair Hutt, would it be, would the measurement still be the same? Would it be for one minute per hour? Uh, I seven? recommend striking that. I don't really understand the one minute concept. I, I, just I, I believe that's because you might get that for a second, but if you get a s an increase in sound for a second, that's not really um, reflective of what's happening on the property. So they measure it for a minute to see if for a minute you have a sustained reading of over, in this case, it'd be 70. Because you might have someone scream, and then that might shoot it up for a moment. But then that doesn't mean that that's, that's the noise being sustained for the course of the, for the event. Provided that the noise monitor is collecting the reading at exactly that time. 
Yeah, so, and it, but that's okay. Is that one minute only per hour, or I mean, I don't want to. And is it a clock one hour minute, or one is minute, it? And then <laughs> I'm gonna do oh oh another minute, and then I get my you know, 37 collections of one minute over the the, the uh, limit. I, and, I, and is it per clock hour or is it per hour of the event based on when it starts? It just feels like there's a lot of ambiguity there to me. Right, and, and I, I think that was intentionally left that way because we wanted to give the event monitor the discretion to determine when he or she felt the event was getting loud and then when they felt it was getting loud, they can make a, rec they can make a recording. Because the, the thought being if we had it on a interval basis, uh, I think you might miss out on the expertise on the ground and the expert on the ground is the event monitor who's trying to keep track of this for the benefit of the city. But I don't have a problem leaving it in. My, my preference is to make it as simple and as understandable for everyone as possible because we want, essentially we don't want it to come up against where go, we're going back to code enforcement again. Right. We want it s simple enough so that the the, uh, the applicant can say explain simply to the DJ, hey, look, we have this issue in town. We want to make sure we stay within, you know, this. So let's not make it too loud, f even whether it's for a long or short period. And so that when the monitor is standing at the property line or on the, you know, I, f I figured they'd walk up and down the sidewalk and they'd say, okay, yeah, it's below 70. We're okay. Yeah, I, I think if I understood the, the commission's feedback, it doesn't really make sense to have a measurement on the campus because the complaints aren't being generated by people on the campus. They're being generated by people at beyond the property line. So it only makes sense to take that measurement at the property line. And if, the, if that's the only standard, then 70 decibels is a relevant standard. And so if, if I understand Commissioner Hutt, the, the new standard would be basically three, a, a revised version of 3.7.1, which would read event noise limits should not exceed 70 dBA up to the property line measured for one minute per hour, defining some type of measurement. Or in the alternative, you don't have to define that measurement and you could leave it to the discretion of the event monitor to determine what that appropriate measurement should be. So the, the time reference should be. Uh, right. And, and how to conduct that measurement. Yeah. Well, they've, they've got I think that makes more I, sense. I just wanted to comment from a practical standpoint. What the uh, monitor does is when the music starts, they basically do monitor the four sides of the campus, and that's when they make the adjustments. So, that, you know, have the DJ turn the music down or whatever needs to be done. So, you know, I think you want to give the event monitor some flexibility to do those type of things. And, and the event monitor, um, it's not just the event monitor on site. There are in addition to the event monitor, Alverna will have a staff member present. And so if the event monitor takes a reading on the perimeter, on the boundary that says it's above 70 dBA, I would assume they'd contact the Alverno staff person to let them know, turn down the music please, and they'd make a adjustments accordingly. Yeah. So I'm gonna propose, and you guys can Tell me I'm wrong here, but I'm going to propose that we change 3.7.1 to read event noise limits shall not exceed 70 dBA at the property line till 9.30 p.m. through 9.30 p.m. And 3.7.2, I would love somebody to suggest language for... 9.30 on. In between the time of 9.30 and 10, all the same language above it that you just read, except 64 dB. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I didn't note that. Between 9.30 and 10, what's going to be the... 64. So we're, we're, we're currently following your city code. So are you proposing a citywide code amendment to go to at what you're going to do at 930 and what would the decibel limit No, we're be? trying to make a reading of ambient easy because the issue is 6 dB above local ambient and your sound expert told us that it's a quiet neighborhood that usually is 55 so that would put us at 61 and we're, we're still above that. We're, what we're trying to do is to make it easy to for the event monitor as we talked about before the checklist and the roadmap 
have it very simple about how to do this. And the problem with measuring the local ambient is it provides a lot of ambiguity and doesn't provide it with a good uh, measurement tool. So the, the goal is to try to simplify and the concept within our current code of six, de de six decibels above the local ambient. So that's what you're proposing for after 930? Six decibels above the local ambient? No. <laughs> that, was, that was, could I be of any value? Could I make one suggestion? Well, a couple of suggestions. I think 70 dBA at the property line is, is fantastic. Um, 10 p.m. is standard time for noise cutoff. Regardless of Alverno having their events stop at 930, which is great, 10 p.m. is also in line with city code as well, in which general daytime ambient is 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., and then 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. is considered nighttime ambient. So if you stick to 10 p.m. as your noise cutoff, then you're in line with your own code language, which just makes it easier for you to enforce, and you, then you don't have one timestamp for one project and a different timestamp for another project, just throwing it out there. And then from 10 p.m. on, it's actually easy to do the, it, it's much easier to say 6 dBA above local ambient from 10 p.m. on because ambient is much easier to measure after 10 p.m. once the event has been shut down and people are leaving. Someone with a noise monitor will see that noise fluctuation drop quite a bit. And if it's still rising, you'll be getting noise complaints anyway. You, if you try and put a decibel number to it, you'll get more noise complaints than if you don't. My suggestion is for 371, 70 dBA up to the property line uh, through 10 p.m. And for 372, you could say from 10 p.m. on for a noise not to exceed 6 dBA above the local ambient. But if the event is supposed to be shut down by 10 and everybody gone. So yeah, at so 10 p.m., it should just be ambient. I completely agree. So, there, so then the there's, there, there's no... T at that point, there's no temporary event generating noise, so we don't need to regulate it. We, we, we're concerned with regulating the noise generated by the temporary events. Understood. Yeah. Ken? And, and I, I think... From 9.30 to 10, I, cars are leaving the property. Does that create an issue with noise? I think that... Um, so yeah, so there's no music or... I think that because the music's going to stop at 9.30, Who's trying to that start? if there's other noises... We're not, 70 dBA is the code across the city. So I don't think imposing a greater standard anywhere. If we're looking for conformity across codes, I think keeping with the existing code is the way to go. And so I think measuring 70 dBA at the property line through 10 o'clock is conforms to our code. And because they have to turn off the music after 9.30, or at 9.30, then if the event monitor hears any music, it gets noted, right? And just to clarify, I believe the code um, says that the baseline for ambient in residential areas is 30 and 50 in commercial areas. So that's the lowest, you know, we wouldn't measure anything below that, and then it references the 70 dBA. And uh, a car going by is 40 dBA, just a single car. I think it's a slippery slope if we start putting in unique codes on this. I think, sorry, uh, go ahead. I think it becomes a nightmare for enforcement. Yeah. So then I recommend that we just put event noise limits shall not exceed 70 dBA at the property line. Period. At any time. Yeah, at any time. And we don't need a 371 or a 372. Just nope. put it in 37. I'm fine with that. It's it's really simple to Simple is better. Yep. yep. So just okay. 3.7 should be 
Just 3.7. Yep, we don't need 3.71 or any of Was the did anybody have anything more? Mm. I think no. three we've flogged three dot seven. We can probably move past that. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything for a while. I think fourteen dot six was my next one. Four or fourteen? Fourteen. I have a question on five five. It, it is this the traffic plan? Uh, it does. Uh, I would be. I feel a little happier if it had flow arrows that told me where people are going because it does reference. Yes, parking is provided in both Mitchell and Wilson parking lots. Vehicles access to these parking lots provided via the campus internal roads. So there's an internal road is not quite obvious to me. I walked it once because it goes between the existing classrooms and Grandview, I believe. No, Mitchell, no. no. Would it's you? The, it's the villas roads that are um, basically on the west side of the villa. Commissioner Spears, would it be helpful if we put up the map on the screen and maybe we could use the laser pointer to indicate what the flow would be? Sure. So, so where it says guest parking, the, the triangle says guest parking is provided in both Mitchell and Wilson parking lots. Vehicle access to these parking lots is provided via the campus internal routes. Yeah, there's internal roads between the, do you have the pointer? I can. There we go. Okay. So here's Mitchell Linda. Uh -huh. And you've got basically the parking lot here. Right. There's an access road, the old villa road that runs down this way. The exhibit, you, if, if you could move the exhibit up a little bit, there you go. And then basically it goes down to Highland. Right. And then we've got a road back here on the north side of the villa between the classrooms and the villa. <laughs> So these are the villa roads. Okay. So, so there's the Wilson lot there, and uh -huh. that's the uh -huh. Mitchell Linda lot. And that's how so they it, get. Yeah. I'm sorry. We try to keep all the the parking uh, traffic on campus during the event. We don't want people driving around the neighborhood. Okay. And you close the Highland Gate before any ceremony or event. Yeah, to my understanding, yes. That what it's you don't see it there on the map, but it's at the bottom. It's down at the bottom, and mm -hmm. that's because there you go. That's because you don't want people mm -hmm. driving down that driveway. If, yeah. if they're coming, yes. I'm sorry. If they are coming in, so we alternate it between. So if we have a wedding one weekend and then the next wedding, uh, the, a, a couple weekends later, the wedding in the first weekend, maybe they would come in the Highland Road. So once the guests have arrived, we close the Highland Gate. Because that means they're going to exit at the end of the wedding out of Michelinda. Then the following wedding, those guests would come in Michelinda's gate and go out Highland. And go, go out, out Highland. Highland. So they get mm -hmm. they we switch off very so that you're not the people on Michelinda aren't always getting the guests leaving. They get it's, it's alternate alternating events. And vice versa. Hmm. And the vendors come in, depending on the size of the truck, come in Michelinda or come in um, Highland. I mean, sorry, Wilson. <coughs> and and, and park at the villa. I thought it said in here that it was, everybody was going to use the Michelinda. That's what I thought too. Yeah, little the ones that just like the the 
DJ may have his own car. He would come in Wilson. And, and it's the bigger trucks like that are coming in with equipment or coming and, in. And you've closed the Wilson gate to mitigate the the right. traffic on Wilson. Correct. Okay. And the only person over there is the guard. The guard and the monitor. And and it probably the vendors. They're parked. They're, yeah, they're yeah, parked they're over behind there the villa. by the villa. Okay. Yeah, the vendors park in this area. <coughs> So the only ins and outs are on Mitchelland and Highland. How do you communicate that to your uh, rent people renting or using the facility? Yeah. yeah, it's in the contracts. Do you use a map? Or? And we um, uh, no, there we are. We tell the um, the uh, the wedding planner normally. They're the ones that let the guests know which way to come in. You just tell them you don't have anything in writing. Or no, it's in the contract. Okay, but it's all in writing. There's no maps or anything. Well, we would use this map. If you're going to use this map, I think you should shade the roads because okay. it's really hard to see the roads from the landscaping. All right. Yeah. And so it's the roads and the parking. Okay. Yeah. And so. Thank you. Well, I commend you for using Mitchell Linda and and keeping pe keeping traffic off of Grandview and Wilson. Thank you. OK. My next comment is in 10. Um, five dot four. Uh, well, I have something at 9.3. Five? 9.3? Are, are okay. you still on, are you on 5 still? Um, I came back to 5 because it oh, had okay. to do with traffic and parking. I saw that go to 14. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, deliveries and pickups for rental event furniture shall be made on weekdays before 6 p.m. and on those occasions where pickups must occur on Sunday because of a scheduled school-related or non-rental event on a Monday, the pickup shall commence no earlier than 12 noon. So here we were trying to give this Sunday day of rest to the neighbors. And we're saying that equipment's going to get picked up. And the reason is because on Monday morning they need to hold class and they had, need to have school. And so things have to be reset so that school can function on 7 o'clock on Monday morning. And we were told that it hardly ever happens and we requested some kind of volume or limitation on that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like that got addressed, if memory serves. And, and this is for those religious events? This is deliveries and pickups on Sundays, 5.4. So a wedding happens on, on Saturday, and so that they can comply with the time they leave. The next day, the rental company has to come and get them because there's something going on at the villa Monday morning. Correct. And so people are going to come and be there on Sunday now. And it's only supposed to happen once in a while, but we never got a scope or. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, it was, they might book a wedding so far in advance that they wouldn't know that that was the Saints day that needed the. Yeah, that was a, they couldn't keep the schedule. Yeah. that they. And, and the reason it came up was because that we ha we heard from the neighbors that they would at least like to have Sunday be of some peace and quiet. The same way conforming with every other part of the town as well. Right. Chair, Chair Dennison, if, if you'd like, we can have the event monitor figure out a way to track how many of these actually happen and report back, assuming you didn't want to adopt the regulation today. I mean, I guess that's one way we could do it is look at the first years and then revisit. But, but keep in mind, the, the purpose of the one-year review is to see if there's violations. It's, we, don't, we don't get a change the, the conditions. That's true. That's so, true. 
if, if we don't set a condition, they can't violate it. And so it, it, if they could be perfectly in compliance and we yeah. find out, but it's a big problem. Yeah. And we're like, well, we've already approved it. And those are the conditions that we put in. Okay. So why don't we ask the applicant how many of these they'd like permission to do a year? Yep. The Sunday thing? The Sunday pickup? Yeah, the Sunday pickup. I, I, I think that they had told us it, it rarely happens, so it seems like we could come to some number. Maybe one a quarter? every three months something like that just one every three months one every three months yeah something like that one a quarter or okay yeah i think i do you want to do or maybe one not a quarter or four a year or i think yeah probably four I, a I think four a year is better yeah, than four a year. so i think we just need to say on not more than four occasions per year okay. and then we can just leave the rest where pickups yeah. must occur blah 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 okay. yeah okay good Peggy, you did something. I nine point three. That sorry, I later in have something in seven. Okay. Um, nighttime lights. Temporary event lighting shall be hooded and directed in such a manner as to not directly impact surrounding properties. Um, I think that. Somewhere else in here, it had specifically said set lighting. And I like that because we don't want people to trip as they walk through the villa. I'm just trying to be practical about this, right? I think that I've driven by some, uh, some filming where they would float a soft light in uh, overhead so that there was more ambient lighting and it sounds like that wouldn't comply with this. So are we saying that they'll have to figure out safety lighting so long as it doesn't project outside of that? I think there's already lighting on campus. As, as I've walked around, I, I remember seeing lights on campus as I go up and down Wilson. Um, so those would be there anyway. I think what we're what you're referring to is any temporary lighting for an event yeah it's the same language in 14.6 with regard to set lighting okay i think if we're lighting pathways that's not gonna i mean that's down right yeah it, it shouldn't should be. it shouldn't it okay. shouldn't get in the way of neighbors okay Commissioner Dallas, what was your next item? Um, 9.3. Um, I'm just curious about 6.1. All property gates should be locked one hour after the event ends. Um, does that make it 11 o'clock or does that make it 10 o'clock? One hour after, that sounds like 11. But if everybody's out by 11. I, I'm wondering if that's not a carryover from when there was going to be some grace period in there for striking or whatever. It certainly seems like even if we wanted to give a little bit of time for people to get out, we could, uh, an hour seems like a long time. Because it's supposed to be Everybody's supposed to be out by that. 10. Yeah, I'm just comfortable with everybody out by 10, like gates locked. Uh, uh, that may be hard to enforce. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's going to be, you know, security yeah, people security and whatnot. Guard, I, I, I think that if, if the noise comes up and we start hearing and the monitor reports noise, then that's how we would be able to determine that. What would noise would they be reporting after? After 10, what is the reportable level of noise? Well, I, I don't think, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that the event monitor would leave before, like, it, it's not a punch the clock at 10 kind of thing if there's still people there, right? They need to be there to enforce until 
the enforcement is done. But I thought the way we set it up is nobody's supposed to be there after 10. Yes, and I'm saying that if people are there after 10, then the enforcement person will still need to be there working with the facilities okay. person to say so you guys to need to enforce be going. that. Yeah. So is the event monitor the last person to leave? No, this is No? No, I'm just saying it would be the facilities person because they would have to log. The event monitor would be logged. I no, no, but is the event monitor then leave with the facilities person? Yeah. So, so they can log that time yeah. when they leave because they're they're getting to they're watching the facilities person lock the gate. <coughs> okay. Commission, it might it might even make sense to just strike this provision entirely, because if the commission doesn't have a particular interest in when their gate is locked just that they leave that their res that the guests leave yeah. the facility i don't care if they lock their gates they well the other thing is let the public come and saying see that the beautiful they have to lock their gates an hour after makes it seem like they have an hour to exit which is what we're trying to say not right. so yeah maybe just get yeah. Rid of them. so i think maybe we just strike six i, I agree unless somebody disagrees no it's fine it's fine Nine dot three commission. Nine three. Yes. It says Alverno Heights Academy shall hire the on site event monitor. I am absolute disagreement with that. I think the only way we're going to get um, a sense of balance here is if the city hires the event monitor and we charge the fee back to Alverno Heights. I I think that the thought here was the same thought as our um, the reports that we have prepared for historic listings that the city will come up and vet a list of people and then rather than being involved in the transaction where they probably have to put overhead on it and all this other stuff that they will let uh, Alverno just handle that hiring and we don't have to be the city doesn't have to be in the middle of the administration side of it but the only people that would be allowed are people that are authorized by the city. I thought under the filming one though, the city is hiring the monitor. Is that right? Did I read that correctly? It, no, that's, so that, that's exactly it, Chair. Um, if, if there is, if there are complaints from residents about things happening on that site, um, and, we've, and the, the city manager determines that the on-site event monitor isn't doing his or her job, then the city manager will inform Alverno that that on-site event monitor can no longer be used and they have to find somebody else. Uh, with respect to your question regarding, is it, is it with regard to filming? Are you saying? In, on I, I thought I read somewhere in here that the, the city is paying for the event monitor in some case. Uh, no, the, the city will not be uh, paying. Which is just and the fees are charged. The fourteen point seven says a cost of third party film monitor shall be included in the film permit, but that's an expense paid by the film production company, not by the city. Because we only have an event monitor for TUPs and we have a film monitor for film. Okay, so and neither of them are paid by the city. But that's included in the fees? Oh I'm sorry. Uh, it's included in their yeah, it's included in the permit. For the film monitor, it's included in the permit. And it's a different process because for the film monitor, they need a film permit. And the one that incurs those expenses is the production company, not Alverno. In the, in the special event TUP context, um, it's Alverno that's going to be incurring that cost. And Alverno can then pass that on to whoever the, um, whoever's going to rent that facility. Okay. But in neither one, the city's hiring the, the monitors. In neither case is the city hiring the monitors. Yeah. I, I, you know, I. In the past, I'll correct one thing though. In the past, the city has used a part-time film monitor that's been a city employee. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's that's definitely the case, and maybe that's um, what you're recalling because I've mentioned that with regard to the film monitoring process. Um, I would be much more comfortable with a situation like that with the city owning its. Uh, having an employee that's a basically a monitor for events like this. So the city did consider that in their conversations with Alverno. Um, and the city manager felt that that film monitor that we have is a part-time employee. He didn't want to 
hire another part-time employee like that person for this purpose. So it was the city manager's policy decision to propose um, having Alverno contract with a third party over which he'll have veto approval. It's a, it's, it was a cost-saving measure. I'm just trying to figure out where we can control this process. What if we have a, uh, a very extensive checklist sort of program that the event monitor has to follow, like a city form? Right, we, we, we do have that, and uh, the director can, can go through that once uh, these conditions are covered. Okay. And so then, I, I mean, belts and suspenders of having employees is to look at their work and monitor it, right? And so if they want to stay on this list, the city manager or his staff would be able to look through the various reports <coughs> and say, you know, this person hardly, you know. They did a complete job or an incomplete job. So who reviews these r the monitor's reports? Yeah, it's, it's going to be staff, but it depends on who the reporter is. So if it's the film report, it's going to go to the Community Services Commission. If it's for a... Uh, a TUP type event it's going to go to the planning department okay and, and I think one of the things also is that um, uh. the neighbors can comment too if, if they don't like some of the monitors or they think the monitors aren't doing a good job and that goes to staff and I think the reports are also included in the annual report so we'll be able to review them ourselves as well we, we can also post the reports Yes, this guy's just going to say think the same thing. Post them online as they happen. In, in the way in the way we post applications now, we can also post the post event reports. That yeah, might I be think that would be good. The neighbors. And I think if you if you have an event monitor who does a thorough report that looks credible, that that would go a long way to, um, you know, instilling confidence and compliance. Yeah, and if you've got something that just has like two chicken scratches on it, like hmm. So can we add that to 9.3 that they, they'll be posted online? I, I think we I can do that in the event monitor checklist. Yeah, okay. I was going to recommend not including it in the code, just in case. Well, the, uh, just to be clear, the city's going to do that. Right. right. These, these conditions are imposed on Alverno as the applicant, not on the city. So okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I had a question on or just more formatting. The section heading here is compliance with conditions here in Monterey Municipal Code, county, state, and federal law. But then 10.1 just talks about compliance with Sierra Monterey Municipal Code. So, so, so we can either amend the title or amend 10.1 to say other applicable law, but I mean, they're gonna have to comply with that anyhow. So it's just sort of a mismatch I'd like to clean up. And then my next comments are on 13. Anybody have any comments before 13? All yours. I'm good. Okay. I'd just like to clarify that, that these events, I mean, we've got the exception word in the title, but not in the text. So on 13. So I'd like to say in 13.1, religious events are not for profit events that, for are, that further Alverna's religious mission, and we can say, and are not considered rental events nor subject to the uh, limit on section 1.1. Objections. What's next? Did we? Uh, Fourteen point five will need to be modified if we're not requiring locked gates. Yeah, I think also fourteen point four we. We need to make the same change to the prop Alverno property line as we did on the other place. There's a generator reference. Yep. And then in the 14.2, the film shall be limited to 45 days per year. We should clarify that that's also not subject to the limit in section 1.1, just so that we are clear that those are all three separate buckets. 
commission. Uh, the edits I have then are for 14.5. It's going to read lights in all parking lots. Lights in all parking lots shall shut off at 10 p.m. Would that be? Well, the commission's pleasure. I don't. I don't think they shut off the lights in the. I don't. Are they off when I go around? Yeah, I guess they're off. I don't know that we need to dictate when the lights in the parking lots. Should we strike the provision? No, because we do want them to shut off the lights. And at some point in time, the, the, they're going to close the gates and uh, because the, the lights have impact the community. And they're, w when the gates are closed, they don't need lights because no one's there. But we don't want them to leave the lights on. Right. If if perhaps we could ask the applicant whether the lights are automatic or they require they're someone else. One would assume they're timed. To turn off. Yeah, for security purposes, we the the little low lights that I, that are along the um, Wilson. Yeah. That those those stay on until pretty late in the evening um, after everybody's gone, and the ones under the trees do too. But it's mainly for security. Um, about the ones in the parking lot, I think that's the one that. that we're yeah, the, not about. the parking lot, but just the little. Are the ones on what in the they parking lot on a timer? Yeah, they're on a timer. Do you know what time they go off? No, I think they go off some like in the middle of the night, somewhere like closer to dawn, like four, four or five. So they're 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 activated by darkness and light. They're 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 on a light sensor. Mm -hmm. huh. And and they they're all um, hooded, so they we have no complaints from the people on um, Wilson at all. In in fact, they it gives a little bit of light when they're walking the dogs. At night, I don't think they are on all night. I run by there while it's still dark, and they're already off. They're off. They're they're off by then. Yeah. Okay. Com commission, this condition is about lighting for filming. Um, I don't know that this condition is about general light. light yeah, general lighting in parking lots. Yeah, then maybe we should just say ten. Maybe. Oh. If it's if it's for filming, then the filming events are supposed to be over at ten, right? Are you talking about condition 7.1? No. 14.5. 14.5. Okay. Because 7.1 also deals with the parking lot lights. Yeah. We need to change that one too. And, and 7.1 is the general one. How did that get in there? Does anybody know? It, that was there before. That was the original condition. We just, is, is 10 p.m. acceptable on the parking lot? Um, yeah, I mean, that's fine. Okay, let's put 7.1 and... Yeah, when the last person leaves. Oh. Oh. Oh, sorry. We can hear you on I mean, yes, hopefully everybody will be gone by 10, but if somebody's not, it, we would want to not have them fall or anything. It gets pretty dark around there. Mm -hmm. if, if, it's, if it's timed and no one needs to be there physically, um, what's the commission's pleasure? Yeah, the parking lot lights, we do have to turn off okay. physically. Oh. Yeah. So we want to say... Like, I don't know, like 10, 15 yeah, p.m.? Yeah, I think 10, 15. And, and if, it's, it's, if it's manual, we don't need to say at, we can say by, because if they close up shop and go home at 9.30, they can turn them off. Yep. So that's 7-1. I don't think we need the parking lot lights in 14-5. Because it's covered by 7-1. Yeah. Agreed. I think we could say, but what we should say is in 14-6, we should say set lighting and all other filming lighting. I don't know what else there is. All temporary lighting? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want any like yeah. loophole. So fourteen dot six rather than saying set lighting <laughs> should read all temporary lighting. <coughs> and you got the edit on fourteen four? 
What was the edit on 14-4? To conform it to the 150 feet from from the, the Alverno Alverno property line. I'm going to recommend that before this is adopted, we read off what all the amendments <laughs> were. <laughs> now, are we done with 14? We, we could be doing it live. <laughs> We've we missed an opportunity to use the big screen. Although there's tons of red line already, I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, joy. Um, in 15.1, this is the uh, quarterly notice. Um, I, I'd like to include nighttime school events on, on the things that they notice because those are the ones that are planned ahead of time. Okay. So how best do you recommend to uh, go through these <laughs> to make sure that we have a comprehensive copy? Like, uh, do you want to look at that checklist? Sure. Let's yeah. look at the checklist first. Yeah. Great idea. Thank you. Is there an explanation with this? Will, will this be supplemented with the contents the yeah, that are? You can add to the, add to the Cause some of those things, while they look to be a checkbox, may need they don't provide the full picture. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, uh. This I think. This initial list was intended to just be points to, to be covered versus yeah. the actual form. And in the actual form, it's likely to have what the limits are so that they don't have to guess. Right. I, well, they, they would have a copy of the this conditional use permit. Yeah, I think I recommend that because it's taken a couple of lawyers to get this to where it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, it, you know, also a blank for the estimated number of guests that are there would be uh, good information. That's what I just said. Yeah. It should say number of guests not to exceed you know, per this ordinance. Well, n not to exceed is good information, but also exactly at this event, how many guests were there. It, it seems like all this needs like forms to be filled out. Um, like, you know, how many times did the staff and security guard interface, did the, the, the police department interface? Uh, and it, and it, it may want to include a campus map because it says noise monitoring, but it, it's noise monitoring at the perimeter and at what locations so they can just put a X where I was standing when you know whatever yeah and recommend the times you know and some times and then they're supposed to be here and basically keep moving all night long and not be you know rubbing elbows and socializing uh, when, when you say like Sierra Madre Police Department interface does that mean that what did they called to here I'm here this I'm the guy an, an, an officer showed up oh so I'm just okay so I looked at that as 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 the monitor calls the dispatch and says we're having an event I'm the guy here's my cell phone number so if you get a complaint you know let me know that, that this I believe this is if someone calls the police department officer shows up and then they speak to the officer it probably then whatever it is should be made to be more clear I would it, it, I, I think for 
operation sense, it makes sense for the police to know that A, there's an event, and B, that there's somebody on scene and who that guy is, so everybody can talk to each other. Just to provide some clarification, I had provided this list to Vincent as a concept mm -hmm. to start a checklist, because I thought it was a really good idea to have something for the city, the school, and the event monitor. So it's, it's a, consider it a work in progress. We mm -hmm. put the categories there. When I was thinking about interface, I was thinking about not only the situation where the event monitor needs to basically check in with your watch commander right. or however it's going to work, and then um, also if, a compl if an officer is given a call for service, they show up on campus, that should be documented as well. Correct. So this, this is a list of items and there will be additional lines for n notes from the event monitor and then probably we'd also pull together the pertinent conditions that the event monitor needed to check. Mm -hmm. So this is really very, it's very conceptual at this point. Okay. So it's not something that I was thinking you'd adopt tonight or, you know. Okay. If you had some yeah, other, if you had other areas where, that you want to add there, I think it would be helpful. Oh, all right. Yeah, thank you. I know that we're not adopting this, that this will be done administratively through uh, the department. What, yes, and, and, and maybe one thing we can do is create, uh, convert this conditional use permit once if it's approved into a checklist. And so the event monitor can check off all these relevant conditions and then in addition to that, note some of the, these things that aren't re reflected here in this conditional use permit such as um, interfacing with the police department or interfacing with um, Alverno staff, interfacing with the neighborhood, make narrative notes. And, and it may be helpful then that the, 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 the checklist drives the agenda and the success of the monitor because they, when they talked with the Alverno person, they wrote their name down and their cell phone number. And the dispatcher who's the dispatcher and, and you know and so that you know there's a full record that this person interfaced with all the right, correct people and everyone was on the same sheet of music and also perhaps uh, to the left of the checkbox the relevant part of the condition use the permit so that they say well you know why am I doing this because it says so right here and and a campus map so they can you know, note things on a map I like the idea of including the uh, conditional use permit uh, in it, in the uh, checklist process. And is it possible for us to see uh, an enhanced version of this at a future meeting? How about at an annual meeting? <laughs> well, no, I don't want to wait that long. <laughs> well, that'd be a, certainly, we can bring that back. Okay, thank you. Are the... Um, Event monitors going to be posted online, so like if, if there's an event that is happening, a, a neighbor wants to know how to contact the event monitor. Is that going to be posted on the city's website or on Alverna's website or? Yeah, I. Yeah, I think so. It's it's something for the department to consider. Um, since applications are posted, we may want to include that information in the application per event, because that event monitor may change from event to event. Okay. Yep. One of the things we, we wanted to do internally is have a cell phone that we would have just for the event monitor. Excellent. So they'll, they'll basically check in with us, we'll give them the cell phone, neighbors will have that cell phone number, it won't keep changing on them, so they'll basically be able to contact the event monitor. That'll be very helpful. Yeah, that's a good idea. Cause yeah, it might be nice if the uh, if the uh, the event monitor schedule checklist, whatever you want to call it, maybe is also uh, digital, so it's all on the phone. Oh, that may be a bridge too far. Oh, <laughs> great, great idea though. Because <laughs> it's just so much easier to navigate that, especially in the dark. Mm -hmm. than a I think that. And pen. We'll have to trust the department to take a yeah, first pass at all of this rather than <laughs> spending our time at the podium helping them. Right yes. now we're a clipboard community. Yep. All right, so um, we've seen the checklist. Should we go back through per Mr. City Attorney's recommendation to ensure that we've got all the edits accurate? 
So we, uh, we began on general conditions. Uh, I believe Commissioner Hutt wanted to change number eight, Planning Commission shall hold a public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Dennison indicated that we should insert uh, shall, let's see where, let's get these, uh, where it says kind of in the middle of the, where it says Planning Commission shall be granted flexibility. Determine time frame of review and, public and unless hearing. otherwise designated, the public hearing shall be held on the first anniversary and, and every year thereafter, striking mm -hmm. other. other. Yep. And you're, you're also going to remove the word semi from the second sentence at the very end. So we'll just read annual meetings. No, no, that's. Um, that's a different section. That's, yeah, that's a different section. But oh, it, okay. You're it, talking from Alverno's semi-annual meetings. Right. Okay. Well, was that semi-annual or is that biannual? Semi-annual. Semi-annual, yeah, yeah. And then, let's see. Bob proposed, uh, Commissioner Spears proposed modification to section 1.4. But that was left that unresolved. Applicant didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So okay. we can go back to uh, prohibit two. Yeah, so I, I think it's two that we've got our next changes. Well, we can, I mean, if we can work with city staff on that, and I can also talk with the school staff to see if they can do that. I, mean, I don't, we, it first came up tonight, we just don't know. I'm just looking for ways where you can have two events and not make. Yeah, I understand. Much noise. Right. Commissioner Spears, just to make sure I understand the condition that you're proposing. Sure. So you were proposing that in the event where there are two sporting events happening at the same time, right. Alverno would have the option of inviting one of those sporting events to be without athletes only. To be athletes only. Whereas the other one can include yeah. uh, visitors, I think right. is the term. Because there'll be times when they're they're I mean, if they're running any kind of athletic program, there's going to be more than one event at a time. And this says that, you know, this prohibits that. Right. And I was merely offering a way in which they could have athletes only um, and at least at one event. Mm -hmm. What if, just to pull the rest of the commission, is this, is this the commission's collective decision? I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's athletes only, no no parents even from like Alverno. And so I'm not inclined to regulate simultaneous school activities, to be candid. I think um, schools on the regular have multiple events at the same time and that's what you get when you live near a school. But I am not in favor in any way, shape, or form of concurrent events that would be any other type or any combination. If there's a school event, they can have a school event. There's filming. There's a wedding. There should be no concurrent across those three groups. But to me, it's their school. They should, they should be allowed to have the events that they want to have during the normal hours that they would be having events. Yeah, I, I agree. So does this, I w want to make sure I'm clear, does the concurrent event you're referring to is if we had a wedding on a Friday, we would not have a soccer game? Or is Correct. that kind of, that's your thought, right? Is that, Correct. that's what you're proposing? At the same time, though. At the same time. It, you could still have it the same day is if you have the soccer game in the afternoon and then the wedding in the evening. You just can't have them both at the same time. And there has to be at least an hour in between the events. I believe is what it reads. Okay. But if there's filming, then if filming's and on campus, there would be no events. events, no school events right. if there's filming. Right. And I don't know if we can agree to that. Hey, that's the problem. Yeah, that, that's... That's a bridge too far. <laughs> yeah, that's the crux. That's exactly right. That's that was, that was also... St staff's understanding was that they wouldn't be concurrent. What's that? 
I, I'm sorry, I said staff's understanding was that the events wouldn't be concurrent. So if there was filming happening, right. um, there wouldn't be a, like a, a wedding happening at the same time. No, well, what normally happens is if they are filming, like if they are filming, filming, then we can't do anything else at the same time. So like, yeah, like we couldn't have a softball game or anything like that. But if they're just getting the set ready, like That's they're correct. just in there painting the villa for the film, and it's you know one truck or two trucks, there could be a soccer. I mean, there wouldn't be any other people there at the villa except for <sighs> the one thing that paints. I mean, but, and the school might have a softball game. You see what I'm saying? It, admittedly, this is because we're still in school. I mean, we have to let school go on while they're in the even during the filming, school is happening. Yeah, so it, it sounds like we don't have consensus on this particular item. So I, I recommend that we have staff work with the applicant on this and we can revisit yeah. this. Because um, I mean, there's it's really something that's very complicated. I, I think one of the issues we have here is the concept of event. Yes, like you use the word event and you think of something that happens like right now, but filming is over a span of time. And so it's not really apples to oranges. Or wait, it is apples to oranges. It is apples, apples to oranges. Yeah, this is the problem. Yeah, but I think that the problem is that while for two hours they might be painting and be the quietest painters on the earth, the next minute they're moving their paint cans around and putting them on dollies and creating just as much noise as if they were filming, right? And well, so I think that we're it's the amount of use it's an it's a use intensity it's issue. a use intensity and, issue. and what it's going to what people are going to look at is hold it they have a permit for the next four days to film on this and they're having soccer games therefore that that's interpreted as a heightened intensity of use and that's going to get well you know these too much stuff is happening and that may or may not be true based on what the what the filming people are doing. So I don't know how we can, well, I'm interested to figure out how we could make some kind of arrangement. I'm just looking at, okay, if you're gonna have all these things happening on campus, we try to wanna tone down the impact on the, on the community. Therefore, you know, if you're gonna have, if you wanna have multiple events, one of them has to be more quiet. You know, that's that was my offer on that. Yeah, and if, I mean, if there's, if there is a way to figure out certain phases of quieter concurrent events, I mean, I understand that it's complicated, but I think we need to be able to find a, a solution, and I don't think we're going to find it tonight. So I, I think that this is this is something that we're going to have to ha ask staff to go back with the applicant and work on. Yeah, I, I think especially because of the filming concept, which is yeah, for a longer duration. It's a longer duration, and obviously, if they're going to film for two weeks straight then they still probably want to play soccer games during that time. Yeah, especially if the film is about soccer. Um, <laughs> we haven't even, yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Creating a third cast class. Okay. So time of use, we Start reverted to. 30, went to 10 o'clock, and uh, I had a note here where it says Friday and Saturday rental events shall begin no earlier than 8 a.m., including setup. And, and no later than 10 p.m. with all music ending not later than 9.30 p.m. Okay. And then we have a change uh, at section 3.4, still under noise. Dancing is permitted inside the villa with all amplified music directed uh, to the interior of the villa. <coughs> And that was going to be on the checklist. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify, is dancing still allowed on the outdoor terrace? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, section 3.6 regarding air conditioning. Yeah, we need 3.5. or 3.5 oh, three three is 150 on the ground. On the property line. Right. Alberno property line. Right, okay. And 3.6, we had a discussion, um, but we didn't come to conclusion on that. And yeah. three, and Other three point than it's still negotiated by the city. Yeah, I don't think we need any language changes. It's right. just we talked about the kind of things that are going to happen. And at the first um, annual review, we can have an update on, on that. And then under 3.7, 
we modified that condition to read shall not exceed 70 dBA at the property line at any time and we struck 3.7.1 and 3.7.2 yep and going down to section 5.4 under traffic and parking we inserted so deliveries and pickup for rental event furniture shall be made on weekdays before 6 p.m. and then inserted on not more than four occasions per year. Yep. And then we have, uh, we're striking 6.0 vehicle access to the Alberno property. Director, I, I have on 5.5 that um, per, I believe, Commissioner Dallas's request that Alverno will provide a revised map. With, or, with, or with, the, with the traffic flow. With the traffic flow, a revised exhibit one. And the shaded roads and parking. Yeah. With, so yeah. with, with the flow and shaded roads. Yes, I have that on the, yeah. okay. on the exhibit itself. Um, so going back to 6.0.0, they're, they're basically have been uh, omitted, they're st uh, stricken. Uh, nighttime lights, we talked about um, by 10.15 p.m., but I wasn't sure if that was, if we decided not to do that. I think we want to do that, right? Yeah. Yep. Lights in all parking lots shall be shut off by 10.15 p.m. Okay. Uh, 14.6. So we've got in 10, we've got cleanup of the. Yeah, reference header. backing back to 14.6. And uh, 9.3, Peggy had a comment regarding. We talked about the event monitored but made no changes. We left it with the city. And we were going to change the title from federal law to maybe just referencing Sierra Madre, you know, Sierra Madre Municipal Code for 10.1, title of 10.1. And possibly clarify 10.1 by including or other applicable laws. And on religious events, exception 13.0, we were going to add language and are not rental events pursuant to section 1.1. What notes do you have on that? 13.1 says religious events are not for profit events that further Alver Alverno's religious mission and are not subject to the limits under 1.1. Then we have under film or photography activity under section 14, we have changes made to 14.2, um, again referencing section 1.1 again. We have 14.4, um, again referencing generators 150 feet from the property line. We have a change to 14.5. Lights in all parking lots shall shut off at 10 p.m. I struck it. No. I think no, that's, that's for film. I think we left it in for film. 14.5 Four, was struck in my version. We, oh, we struck it, so it, because it was going to be, yeah. Overview. Yep. The entirety. Yep. Okay. 14.6, we included temporary. All temporary lighting and all other, uh, yeah, all temporary lighting shall be hooded or directed in such a manner. Right, striking set lighting. Yeah. yeah. 
and section quarterly notices 15.1 we added uh, let's see to applicant property owners shall provide a quarterly notice to all residents within a 300 foot radius of the villa regarding all temporary uses film or photography activity and religious events we added and school, we events. school events within okay so, so film or photography common yeah. night school events I believe it was nighttime. Is that nighttime school events? Yeah, nighttime school events. Okay. And that was it. Well done. Yeah. So we need, basically we need 1.4 to get reworked. So with the exception of 1.4, I think we're, we're there. And that should give city council sufficient guidance as to what we're pushing back to them on their deadlock. <laughs> I'll report back regarding the TUP deadline. Thank you. Um, I guess we will want to continue this to either a date certain or a date uncertain based on the uh, calendar. The I have calendar. a question with regard to the approval of the CUPs. Do we need to approve them both at the same time? Or is this temporary use one? Could this go ahead of the, the master plan? They can go independently. OK, because it seems like this is the kind of stuff that could get worked out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're working on the school thing, and they can go independently, we might as well get this one done. And not only that, uh, I think that the director has to extend their existing TUP. That's correct, from August 31st. Mm -hmm. Through whatever the date of this next meeting is, that will, that will be. So we would like to have that meeting sooner rather than later. So I'm assuming, just looking at the calendar, uh, the soonest we'll be able to calendar this item is October 6th. Is that acceptable to the applicant? That'll be up to the director. Yes, with the with the extension. Um, well, I mean, we, yes. What I'm looking for is a motion to uh, continue this to a date certain of October 6th. I moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Motion carries unanimously. A break. And we will take a 10 minute break before we come back for some. Oh, I, before we take a 10 minute break, <laughs> now that we are on the record, I would like to open up <laughs> public comment for anyone who would like to speak on something not on tonight's agenda for three minutes. Oh, yes, I certainly do. And thank you for allowing me to speak again. Deb Sheridan, Valley Vista Drive. At the last planning commission meeting regarding the Meadows project, you were asking your insightful questions the way you have been. Commissioner Hutt said he didn't feel comfortable with approving all the elements of the Meadows project until the widening of Carter was resolved. Yet, then immediately after a short break, you all approved every aspect to send this along to the city council which has already said, all five of them, that they will approve this project, or you might say they intimated it if you don't like approved. Um, and this came before the required two city council meetings even took place. I have the feeling that extreme pressure was put on you commissioners because why else would you so suddenly cave in in such a manner. Director Gonzalez, would you please explain the following timeline? September 13, City Council regular meeting. September 15, special hearing before City Council regarding the Meadows project. September 27, City Council regular meeting, I would assume. October 6, special hearing number two. 
would you please explain exactly what is going on here? Because the alleged transparency of City Hall gets murkier and murkier. No one seems to know about these special meetings except staff. Is this an attempt to speed up the whole process of approving the Meadows to appease New Urban West investors as Representative Frankel asked for backing for back in your June meeting? Our drought continues unabated. Water levels are getting lower and lower. Jackson, Mississippi has totally run out of water. Yes, com yet Commissioner Dallas, you said no one else has water, inferring that that should make it less of a problem in approving this horrid project. Meanwhile, now, Castaic is burning, the mountains above Azusa are burning, and we are told that we can't use the water that we have. Yet you approved this ill-designed project, and we know already City Council will say, Planning Commission approved it, so we will too. Do I sound angry? Yeah, I really am. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Anderson, if I can respond to at least the time frame issue. Absolutely. Okay. So at the end of this meeting, I was going to uh, let the commission know that we were going to cancel our regular September 15th meeting so we can allow the city council to host at 5.30 p.m. a special city council meeting to address the meadows as a single item instead of trying to squeeze it in to the rest of their agendas. Uh, the September 13th agenda is quite lengthy already. We do are going back to um, council at the second meeting for Alverno as their regular meeting. So the reference to October 6th is not correct either. Okay. Thank you. I recall hearing a lot of that at the last planning commission. Yes. Okay. Um, at this time, we will retire for a 10 minute break.
husband's a writer. He's always correcting me. All right, we will now resume the September 1st Sierra Madre Planning Commission meeting. Moving on to public hearing number two, conditional use permit amendment 21-19 and addendum to the mitigated negative declaration to update the Alverno Heights Academy Master Plan. Does staff have a presentation? We have a PowerPoint presentation. As you can see, this meeting has been continued and it was continued from the July 21st meeting where we opened up the meeting and did not have any uh, planning commission deliberations and continued it to September 1st. The project team uh, and Alberta Heights uh, representatives are here this evening. It's a big long list. I do, I believe that the Arbor Gate consultant is not present this evening. A little background since the last time I went through this presentation was last year in 2021, November. So in 1959, the Planning Commission did adopt a resolution to allow for a school use on this property. The general plan also allows for expansion of institutional sites. And also at the July 7th, 2020 uh, or 2011 subsequent C uh, CEP amendment was approved by the Planning Commission. And tonight, Alberta Heights is requesting that the Planning Commission consider conditional use permit 2103, which consists of the addendum to the mitigated negative declaration and monitoring program that was approved in 2011 to update the campus master plan. And very quickly, the project site is located at 200 North Michelinda Avenue and it occupies 12.10 acres and it is the largest campus in the city. The property is, uh, adjoins uh, the city of Pasadena to the east on Michelinda Avenue, surrounded by R1 low density residential uses to the north, east and south being Grandview Avenue, Wilson Street and Highland Avenue. Both the land use and zoning designations are institutional. So the master plan is proposing a number of improvements both to the upper campus as well as the lower campus. The improvements include the caretaker cottage, or this is the caretaker cottage to revert that back to classroom use. This is uh, the chapel currently used as a chapel and converting that back to um, a storage and garage. In addition to the performing arts building, about 1,200 square feet, demolition of the 1,910 or 1,915 square foot faculty, former faculty offices, and that will be replaced with uh, 31 parking faculty parking spaces. It also includes the adaptive reuse of the villa for the school's business office, chapel, faculty lounge, and student activities. Uh, there's also, as part of the internal circulation improvements and drop off, uh, to be included as a new fire truck hammerhead turnaround. Uh, there's also the, the, will retain the original curved driveway and historic gate. The lower school site includes the permanent classrooms to accommodate TK through eighth grade co-ed instruction. The addition to the lower campus will conform with the enrollment of 400 students per the 2011 master plan. The structures include a 20,000 square foot building, partial three-story elementary school a 2,000 square foot single story administrative offices for faculty use, and a 3,000 square foot single story middle school. Also included are a 670 square foot playground and a sports court, a 60 by 70 foot playground and a 100 by 70 foot sports court. 
A view analysis shows the massing model of the building for diagrammatic purposes. The view from Mitchelland Avenue looking northeast on the top and the view from West Highland Ave Avenue looking towards the north and west. In the master plan, it includes uh, proposed sectional studies uh, for setbacks and height. Uh, in this illustration, it shows on the west that the main classroom building is set back 20 feet from the existing landscape buffer and fence on Mitchellenda Avenue. And the main classroom building is set back 80 feet from the Highland Avenue property line, again providing an open space buffer from the adjacent homes. Provided as an architectural massing illustration that shows the height of the main classroom buildings running north-south, which follows the natural grade of the site and has been planned to minimize the impact of the historic villa and other significant site features, including the Morton Bay Fig. I'm sure the applicant will go into more detail regarding the uh, purpose of this particular massing and with the attempt to save and not intrude into this large Morton Bay fig as well as the drip line and root, root zone which has very shallow root systems. So this is the concept lower school landscape plan as I mentioned it's saving the large Morton Bay fig and a few other large trees on the property, including a laurel bay and a, um, a kawari tree. Also in response to uh, some comments from the neighbors on Wilson Avenue, the school has already planted four additional 24-inch box olive trees, which you can see are shown with the black dot and also planted seven Italian cypress, cypress trees. And the intent of that is to try to screen the athletic field from neighboring views uh, from the residential area. Uh, there were complaints that the plant material is growing very slowly that was planted originally when the sports field went in. At the last meeting, the Planning Commission uh, postponed or continued this matter to a date uncertain, the master plan, to allow Alverno to reach out to the neighbors. Uh, in response to that, three workshops were held in 2022 in January, January, April, and May. And participant questions were captured in meeting minutes, which are included in tab one in the master plan supplemental, supplemental documents binder. And the topics addressed included turning movement and driveway operations, an updated noise study, and an updated traffic study. So in 2010, the traffic study, which informed the 2011 master plan, um, had the, these particular field counts that were conducted in March 2010. And then during the COVID pandemic during 2020, uh, because in-person learning was uh, not permitted, uh, the traffic consultant prepared a traffic analysis utilizing the synchro model. And that synchro model used an ambient growth factor of a half percent per year over a 10-year period specific to morning peak hours. And the result of that model determined that the expanded school will, have, will not result in significant impact at the study intersections. And once we got back into in-person meetings, residents noted that in-person traffic counts should be conducted when school uh, sessions resumed. So the traffic count, uh, traffic study again was revisited with in-person traffic counts taken in November and February. The counts were conducted on weekdays and February counts were taken over a three-day period. The enrollment at that time was 374 students and it also on one day included after-school events. So the results of the in-person 2022 traffic counts 
were actually less than that predicted by the uh, traffic model in 2020. So the results found that the street serving the neighborhood remains at a level of service A, that the general plan establishes a maximum traffic count on local streets at 2,500 per day or two to 300 per hour. The traffic counts for Wilson Avenue average 550 vehicles per day, which is under the daily total trips of 2,500. The peak monitor, uh, uh, morning trips into the school averaged 111 also under the two to 300 per hour general plan policy. And the, it was found that the remaining streets also had similar results. Alberto also uh, updated the noise study in May 2022 in response to comments from the commission. And the results indicated that noise, level do, noise levels did not exceed noise criteria set forth in the 1998 Villa Noise Agreement, which was referenced in section 3.2 of the report. And that event noise limits at the property line should not exceed six dBA above local ambient. And if event noise exceeds local ambient, but is not greater than 70 dBA from property line, noise levels should be limited to, and we had this whole discussion for the CEP Villa, both apply, and in this case, we could make the same changes to the conditions of approval. So the CSDA concluded that the noise from the Villa's events did not exceed the noise limits established in our city's noise ordinance, and noise levels after 10 p.m. were in compliance with the Sierra Madre noise ordinance as well. The council also asked uh, for, for further information regarding what our, our code enforcement does in, regarding uh, conducting ambient noise readings. So city policy, of course, is to protect the community from unreasonable noises and in no case shall the local ambient noise be less than, and this is what I was referring to before, uh, 30 dBA for interior noise and no residential noise shall exceed 6 dBA above local ambient. And for commercial noise, the baseline is 40 dBA, but in no case shall exceed 8 dBA. So as I mentioned before, 40 dBA is almost seems like a car going by, driving by will we'll hit that 40 dBA uh, trigger. So we find these to be very, very low. So the code enforcement officer actually uses uh, the California state government code to establish the criteria, which says that acceptable residential noise is 50 to 60 dBA, and acceptable commercial noise is 60 to 80 dBA. And there's been occasions, this is uh, an excerpt from just looking at a commercial district ambient sound measurements at different times at different locations to see what typical ambient is along the boulevards of Sierra Madre Boulevard and Baldwin Avenue. So they do range from as low as 63.7 to as high as 74.2 dBA. And we did this exercise to determine ambient and uh, in this case it was directed towards a service station in town and complaints from an adjacent neighbor. So I wanted to touch a little bit upon, upon the CEQA analysis that was conducted for this project, which is the addendum to the mitigated negative declaration that was prepared in 2011. And the analysis determined that much of the uh, analysis would remain unchanged. The results of the 2021 refined project would not create more adverse impacts such that the findings of the certified 2011 initial study mitigated neg negative declaration would continue to apply, including all of the 18 mitigation measures uh, would apply to the project as well. Noise levels, uh, as we just went through uh, for school operations are estimated not to exceed any of the existing ambient noise levels at nearby residential receivers. 
and uh, the facts in the 2011 uh, report or CEQA document specific to wildfire remain unchanged. The tree preservation report determined that there are 13 oak trees within the designated area and all are found to be adequate to good health but have various structural defects. There are several large specimen trees, uh, notably the Morton Bay Fig, the Queensland Kwari, and the Indian Laurel on the property and they should, uh, protective measures should be implemented to avoid an impact not only to the specimen trees but also to the oak trees. There is a proposal to remove two oak trees which must be mitigated according to city guidelines. A cultural resources technical report was also prepared for the 2021 um, CEQA update and that was prepared by Sappos Environmental. The technical report determines there is a less than significant impact to the villa. That was one of the parameters to see what the impacts to the villa would be. And we also reached out, staff reached out to the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians, the Kiz Nation, which uh, also provided brand new, uh, four new additional mitigation measures involving cultural resources. And the tribal representatives indicated that there is a possibility of encountering tribal cultural resources on the property due to excavation. The alternatives before the commission is to approve the conditional use permit and the addendum to the mitigated negative declaration reporting program, approve with modifications, continue or deny, citing the findings that the commission feels cannot be made. Staff is recommending approval of conditional use permit 2103 an addendum to the mitigated negative declaration and reporting program to update the Alberto Heights Academy master plan pursuant to Planning Commission Resolution 2119. That concludes my report. Uh, the applicant does have a PowerPoint presentation as well. Any questions for staff before we go to the applicant? Yes, thank you, Chair Dennison and Commissioners. As uh, Director Gonzalez indicated, the Commission opened the public hearing on the Alverno Heights Master Plan on November 18th. That meeting was impacted by a number of factors. The noise consultant, the traffic engineer could not be present in person, however, they joined by phone. The city attorney also joined the meeting by phone. At some point in the meeting, the consultants reported to us that the telephone line was disconnected. So the commission did not receive presentations from the traffic engineer and the noise consultant. So we thought tonight, instead of going through the entire presentation that we did on November 18th, we would focus on traffic and noise, <coughs> excuse me, and the supplemental materials requested by the commission and the neighbors. But if you want us to go through the November 18th presentation, we do have it available. <coughs> So the commission discussed a number of issues at your November meeting. Uh, there was this issue that we've been talking about almost all night now, separating out the villas events from filming and the school's activities, providing additional screening on the Wilson Avenue uh, perimeter with the athletic field, uh, conducting future design review on major campus buildings, completing a seismic survey of the school's buildings, increasing communication between the school and the neighbors, requiring periodic meetings between the school and the neighbors, review of the grading and tree plan by the arborist and the engineer, and then providing a summary of the 2011 master plan and the proposed master plan improvements. There are obviously other items that you asked for, but those are at least uh, going through your minutes. Uh, those are the ones that we could uh, glean from going through your minutes of the meeting. Now, we previously submitted supplemental documents requested by the commission and uh, the directors indicated some of the tabs. It's a binder that we gave you with tabs. Now we did hold the three neighborhood meetings <coughs> and uh, basically we provided the commission with copies of the meeting agendas, agenda materials, and the meeting notes. Notices were mailed to 194 property owners within 300 feet of the school for all three of the meetings. The neighborhood meeting materials can be found in the first tab of the supplemental documents in the binder. 
At the January 24th meeting, we had 11 neighbors that attended the meeting. The group reviewed and discussed the master plan. Comments were received from the neighbors uh, that included a request for the traffic counts and a noise analysis based on the school's increased enrollment from the prior 2011 studies. The group also discussed adding more trees on the Wilson perimeter. <clears throat> at the April 4th meeting, we had four, meeting, four neighbors that attended the meeting. The group reviewed the proposed landscaping plan for Wilson Avenue and our traffic engineer, Mr. Zimmerman, presented supplemental traffic information. There were discussions of improving the drop-off and pickup of students on Mitchell, Linda, and Wilson. <clears throat> At the May 23rd meeting, nine neighbors attended. The meeting was primarily devoted to reviewing and discussing the noise study on villa events and the additional noise study of the school's outdoor activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. The group discussed the noise limits in the settlement agreement and both school and villa noise limits. We also reviewed the noise monitoring equipment, actually had it, it there for the neighbors to look at, and the monitoring of noise from filming. We discussed the difference between the noise requirements for the school and the private villa events. Uh, the director's already showed you this. Uh, basically, at the request of the commission, we wanted to show good faith and install some additional landscaping on Wilson, uh, and he's gone through what we've done. Uh, the, um, basically, the, the uh, landscape architect recommended that we give some space to these Italian cypress to grow. You know, there is, sh you can see when you go out there that the area where there's a street tree missing has a lot more sunshine and the trees are growing a lot faster than where there's shade from the street trees. They're very large pine trees on the street and they provide a lot of shade uh, during the day. So, you know, it, some of that plant material is taking some time to mature. And then we've also, we decided to plant additional screen uh, material on Highland at the corner of Mitchell Linda to uh, down Highland down to the villa, Villa's Mirror Pond. And we're hoping that this plant material will grow and help to screen some of the lower school campus buildings even before they're constructed. So kind of planning in advance. Now, traffic and circulation, there's significant neighbor concerns that traffic study was based on modeling and not the actual counts. So the school wanted to address this concern and funded traffic counts in November of 2021 and then February of this year. So I'm going to invite Bill Zimmerman, who's our traffic engineer, and Bill's going to walk through a, um, some slides for you. There you go. Of course, that's not going on. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Good evening. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, the Director did an excellent job of presenting a lot of the traffic issues, so I, don't, I won't dwell on those too long. Cause to me, they're exciting. I'm sure they're kind of boring after a little bit. So um, we did two counts, one in November, um, and compared that to the traffic model. And at that time, we realized that uh, the traffic model was more conservative than the actual counts. And then again, to validate the model one more time. In February, we did three-day counts and looked at it again and it validated the November counts that we, that our model was more conservative than actually what the traffic was generating. Um, the model said there was going to be, or predicted there's going to be 727 daily trips, 176 peak hour trips, and 114 p.m. peak hour trips. And both of these, uh, all three of these um, elements were higher than both the February and the November counts. The level of service for all the, the roadways are based upon the Federal Highway Administration's um, level of service, which they developed to actually measure different types of roadways from local roadways all the way to arterials. Uh, service level of A is acceptable, awesome, um, it's free flow, and then you get to a level F, which is failure or stop and go traffic. Uh, all these roadways that are adjacent to the site are running with traffic generated from the, the um, facility are running at a level of service A, so there's no, no issues with that. And then compared, as the director mentioned, compared to the, the uh, 
see general plan of 2,580 teeth, they're all below that uh, on local streets only. Um, with the Wilson Street, uh, the ADT on that is 580 trips per day. Um, so it's well below that threshold and it falls still within that category of A. And here's just kind of a recap of it, Mitchell Linda, all the way down to Highland, all A's. And then this is what the director showed you on this particular um, slide shows you the turning movements going in and out of each one of the driveways. I do want to highlight on Wilson, there was concern about left turn movements going into the upper lot and then the school did implement a program where it was only right turns only and you can see the difference where the left turns have pretty much went down to zero uh, for the uh, February counts. Uh, the overall conclusion is that the traffic is well below what was predicted in the model. Um, all the roadways are working at a um, <laughs> level of service of A and that um, there were some concerns about stacking on Michelinda and this, the academy actually stepped in and had a mitigation plan where they were able to capture a lot of the traffic to pick up um, students by opening the gate at 245 for the 3 o'clock dismissal which helped alleviate part of it and then had stacking internally on the internal roadways. So we're working as diligently as we can as we pick up issues. Um, the recommendations on this is that we're going to continue monitoring both the driveways and the, the adjacent um, roadway intersections and as time goes on we will make more mitigation uh, to make that work a little more efficiently. Um, one thing that we want to highlight is and this is the Highland Avenue exit is that we recommend that we remove this tree, um, rebuild and reconstruct the sidewalk and curb and gutter and driveway to make it flow more efficiently for the exits. Uh, one other note that we had received comments from some of the residents about speeding and, and about parking issues and this was outside of the jurisdiction of the school and we, we would highly recommend that they get the PD involved with any kind of these issues and so they can at least be able to monitor them. Excuse me, do we have we might have some questions for you before you I, I, I just wanted to understand that on the the tree that you're proposing to remove that's that's in the way of the turning pattern is that why you want to remove that well, so it, well there's a, a number of things that are happening there one is that driveway dates to like 1925 it's the original villa driveway so it's not really designed to the geometry of driveways um, it basically needs to be a bit larger so cars can go left and right on the street. Cars turning left, that tree's a major visibility problem. Uh, you really can't see to get you know, safely to make a left turn. The other thing that's occurring with this, not just that tree, but a number of trees, is that you can see what's happening is the curb and the apron are lifting. You know, the tree's being girdled uh, by the infrastructure. You know, when it was planted 50 years ago, I'm sure it was fine, but what's happened now is that tree you know, basically is growing over the curb and there's damaged curb and gutter there that the school, once the tree's out, uh, the school would replace all of that and you know, put all new concrete in. There's sidewalks that need repairing in that area. So there's three or four things going on there. It's fairly complicated. Would, would, would a, a person at that gate assist with people turning left by, by directing traffic? Could, I mean, we, we don't, I, I don't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't answer that, but it's more Julia and Joanne, I guess. I don't know if we want to get our people out into the street. I mean, that's, that's the issue, is putting our people in the street. If, if I may, uh, on that issue, too, is that you're increasing the liability by having so many waves, uh, a vehicle that can't, doesn't have a clear sight distance into traffic. And so the liability then would fall upon the school itself. That it's better to remove it where they have a clear sight distance and make that judgment call themselves. And also as a condition of approval, the Public Works Department uh, recommended removal of the tree for the same reason. Uh, the one tree or the whole? Just the one tree. 
Did, did you have additional questions for the traffic engineer? Okay. All right, now uh, noise. Uh, the neighbors expressed concern in, that the 2021 school noise study did not reflect the increase in enrollment from the return of students when allowed by LA County Health Department. The school wanted to address the enrollment concern and funded a supplemental noise study. So there's two noise studies on after school noise or school noise, not only after school, but during the school day. And they were taken over three days between March 1st and March 3rd. I'm gonna have um, Indy come up now and basically review the study and the findings. Right. Four noise monitors were installed to specifically study and review school noise. I'm going to emphasize that again because there was a slide in the presentation that was just put up there that talked about villa noise. Uh, this has nothing to do with villa noise or any noise related issues to the villa. So the slide that you saw in the previous presentation from that gentleman right there uh, is mixing and matching issues. And so um, I think that's going to add a little bit of complexity to this with when it doesn't need to be. Uh, noise monitors were placed on Wilson, West Grandview, Michelinda, and West Highland Avenues in the locations marked there. So Sierra Madre does not specifically address noise from schools and school children. We have dug through this. Most cities don't address this. LA County even has a line item stating that school children, noise is, school children and noise from schools are exempt from code. However, if I came here tonight and told you that there is no code and they're exempt, that would not be of any value to anybody. So we dug into this and the Sierra Madre General Plan Chapter 6 has what we consider a sort of catch-all which is noise control of non-transportation noise sources. Date and times are listed there. Basically, noise cannot exceed 80 dBA at a distance of 25 feet. And if non-transportation noise is less than 80 dBA at a distance of 25 feet, the noise is exempt from the 6 dBA above ambient that was mentioned at the residential properties and the 8 dBA above ambient for commercial properties. We took measurements from March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. These are the graphs of those measurements, average to 15 minutes. We can average them to any time frame you want. Ultimately, the noise levels never exceed that 80 dBA limit. Here's March 2nd, and here's March 3rd. The following table compares the June 30th, 2021 measurements to the March 22nd, 2022 measurements. And what we found was the measurements during COVID time and post COVID <laughs> um, didn't vary that much. You could see a couple of dB difference here and there. That's pretty normal, kind of par for the course when you're talking about school noise and ebb and flow of traffic and kids. In conclusion, noise levels from outdoor activity from Alverno Heights does not exceed 80 dBA and is in compliance with the city's general plan requirements. After school activity noise is not the major noise source in the neighborhood. Further analysis of the data that is taken indicates that the neighborhood noise is actually dominated by traffic and the 2022 noise levels are consistent with the planning center's noise that was conducted in 2011, which also concluded that the neighborhood noise level is dominated by traffic. Yeah, please, questions? So those, those were taken at those four utility poles? Yes, sir. Next, we'll take a look at grading and tree preservation. Um, as Vincent indicated, um, the Arbors is not here tonight. He's had an ongoing family health emergency. 
Um, Kurt Pedersen, our civil engineer, worked with Mr. Applegate in reviewing the concept grading plan and the tree preservation plan. And Mr. Peterson is here tonight and he can review his discussions with the arborist, the recommendations and modifications to the concept grading plan. I do want to point out these are conceptual grades. Uh, the planning commission will be looking at the design review and the grading plans, uh, final grading plans uh, when these uh, facilities come forward. Okay. One of the things that uh, talking to the arborist that he recommended a 60 foot uh, buffer all the way around the uh, Morton Bay fig tree and that's the circle that you're seeing uh, drawn around here. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, originally the grading uh, did not have any retaining walls and you can see here and around in here that the grading was going to encroach more into the um, uh, within the 60 foot zone uh, with discussions with uh, the arborist his recommendation was to instead of doing uh, cut and fill in these areas to uh, instead place retaining walls uh, along the edges of the sidewalks and walkways uh, which are the red dash lines shown here which is an improvement the other big change is initially the ADA drop-off area was going to be between the TK and the middle school and we were able to move it down here below the TK area and uh, reduce the amount of uh, earthwork uh, right next to the uh, fig tree The other thing that we did review is of the other um, uh, oak trees and special consideration trees. Uh, the two here in dark green are the two oak trees that will have to be removed and mitigated for uh, because they're uh, underneath the proposed uh, school. The four other oak trees that are close to it uh, all uh, should be able to be protected in place. Uh, near the sports fields there are three uh, smaller oak trees that we will be uh, monitoring and uh, seeing if there's ways that we can adjust the grading and location of the sports field to um, eliminate any impacts to these three trees. Um, although not shown on this plan, the cowrie tree is right in this area here, uh, which will not be impacted by the lower school. It will be adjacent, though, to the multi-purpose room that has been previously approved. Are there any questions on the tree or grading plans? Okay, thank you. Director Gonzalez had basically put this slide up. It, it's a master plan summary and it illustrates the improvements approved by the city in 2011 and there was a question at the Planning Commission meeting about what from 2011 has been constructed. There were four phases in the 2011 master plan. The first was to do the perimeter wall improvements on Michelinda which included the view wall, all the new landscaping and then to install uh, landscaping and the uh, the pedestrian trail, the city did not want a concrete sidewalk on Grandview, so we installed basically a, a DG pathway uh, with uh, plants. So that was constructed as part of phase one. Uh, the athletic field uh, was a major lift for the school, and that was uh, either, could be either phase two or phase three, depending on how funding went for the school. Uh, basically the improvements uh, that remain as part of the 2011 master plan are the multi-purpose building and adding the second driveway uh, which was an entrance driveway on the Michelinda parking lot and then enlarging the Mich Michelinda parking lot and then there internal um, a lot of internal campus improvements occurred there was landscaping that was 
uh, basically part of phase four, which you know, we've been implementing and uh, improving the internal appearance of the campus. Um, so, and then this then, uh, the director went through what uh, basically the, the, uh, the 2021 or 2022 master plan improvements would be. So I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on those. We prepared this illustration because we think it basically shows the master plan at build out and I think it's a very accurate representation of basically if you had a bird's eye view of the campus, uh, what it would look like. And we believe it's well designed and the improved school is gonna be a credit to Sierra Madre. Uh, the staff of it has observed it's a very large campus, largest in basically the um, city. And uh, it's basically served by adequate streets and has code compliant off street parking. The traffic impacts from the proposed amendment are less than the impacts if we had basically stuck with the approval of having 400 high school students at the school. Having the TK through eighth grade has really lowered um, some of the traffic volumes. Now, Averno's been an institution in Sierra Madre since 1942 and a school for the past 62 consecutive years. Uh, it provides needed education for Sierra Madre residents and also uh, the, the uh, young folks who basically live in this area, Pasadena and surrounding communities. It's also a major employer of Sierra Madre residents. We believe it's a sig significant asset for Sierra Madre. Now the conditional use permit will eliminate and reduce the school's impacts. The commission expressed a concern in November that the conditions of approval were too ambiguous. Now city staff and a city attorney have worked uh, to ensure that con the conditions are comprehensive and clear. Besides the conditions in Exhibit A, Alverno must comply with about a dozen separate environmental conditions, and again, city codes, applicable county, state, and federal law. We have only one concern. You probably know what it is. It, it regards planning department condition number five on seismic safety. Now, Alverno raised this concern at the commission's November meeting the school understands that all new construction must meet the state's new seismic codes for private schools. However, the school continues to object to the requirement that the school survey and rate are pre-1986 school buildings. We do not understand the purpose of the survey and the rating, nor do we understand what seismic codes these buildings are to be surveyed and rated to. And I think it's interesting to note in your own resolution, the condition was not recommended by the city's building department. Now, we're not aware that the city has taken the appropriate steps to accept state delegation of seismic safety requirements, notified the private schools in the city that you will be adopting a seismic program, adopted an appropriate code at a public hearing, and that you have a plan in place for inspection of all the private school buildings within the city. Now, Alverno undergoes life safety reviews by the fire department annually, and as well, we have insurance inspections and we will continue to make safety upgrades to our campus. So we respectfully request that you delete this requirement in condition five. <clears throat> and we wanna thank the commission in advance for your consideration of our request and we can answer any questions that you might have. So could um, I ask the city attorney then to look into that survey and reference the because I know the, there is a code, there is a code for, for the schools, both pro public and private. And the public schools is the Field Act. And, and I think um, Mr. Fardner will remember on July 7th, 2011, I asked you if you would be willing to build a multipurpose room to the Field Act compliant, to be, and you said yes at the time. There's, there, the Field Act doesn't apply to private schools. <clears throat> There's a special state law that applies it to does. private schools. So we would build to that. It was adopted in 1986. Right. Yeah. And it's part of the, the California State Seismic Survey Commission. Correct. And I believe also in that it does recommend a survey, but the survey may not. You, you want more specificity on the survey. I th when I read through that report, I think what it's doing is basically 
shifting the state's responsibility for this to local jurisdictions. They want you to take responsibility for seismic programs on private schools. And that's your choice as a community if you want to do that. The point that we're making is that imposing it on Alverno is unfair to Alverno if you're not going to do it citywide. So you need to do a survey and inventory of all the pre-1986 school buildings that you have in the community and involve them in this process that you basically want them to meet certain seismic codes. But so that, that's our concern. Okay, well, the city attorney, I, I will ask the city attorney to do that, but remember, they're not, the other schools in this, in, in this, in this town are not in front of us right now. There's only one, there's only one applicant that we can see. And so, and I, I believe what the, what the intention is, is that the applicant apply, uh, you know, abide by the, by the, by the code. You know, again, if you've got an adopted code, show us what it is. Okay. Commissioner, I'll report back regarding what the relevant statutes are and I'll also report back regarding uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the representatives from Alverno to figure out exactly what the costs are of such a study, uh, what the burden would be to the st what the burden would be to Alverno, uh, and I will report back at the next meeting. Okay. Um, I, I have a couple of questions uh, for the applicant. Is school open and operating now? Have you guys started your school year? Yes, I believe the high school girls were back about two weeks ago. And uh, we started this week with the lower school. Yes. Okay. I, I just wondered because I drove by to look at how the parking and, and people queuing, and I wanted to make sure I was getting an accurate representation. Yeah. Because it doesn't do any good to do that during summer. Uh, no. Um, and then on the uh, trees that were planted um, on the Wilson side, th those have all been planted that, that you plan to plant. There's not more that are coming. No. No. Okay, because I, I went by and I looked at the diagram versus what was planted and I was having sort of a hard time uh, lining them up and I understand there's sort of field changes that, you know, when people build, uh, plant things. So I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, as much as you're currently planning to do. Yeah, again, our, the uh, landscape contractor we used to do the field mm -hmm. had planted a series of Italian cypress and olives in that area when the field was built about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recommended, we, we talked with city staff and basically staff said, let's go along with and keep planting more Italian cypress and more of the, the, the um, olive trees, right. which we did do. So we brought some box olives in and we added some, I believe 15 gallon mm. on the Italian cypress. So they, they're planting them anticipating that they're going to grow obviously we don't want to be cutting trees down a couple of years from now because we've over planted it right and just speaking of cutting trees down we're we're talking about cutting one street tree down to uh, facilitate the rebuild of the driveway but are there other street trees that we have concerns with well we we um after the november meeting we walked the area with the public works department and the planning department and basically there were no other street trees that they wanted to to be removed. They did ask us to do the city code trimming on the trees, which you've got a specific code for, yeah, eight you know, feet or, or yeah, 12, feet eight, or 12 or whatever the requirement is. There's a clearance requirement. So there's no other street trees we're, that we're required to take out that we're aware of. Okay. And then the neighbors basically indicated they didn't want more of the trees taken out. They like right. The, no, I, I yeah, they like the shade. I think if we took out all the street trees, it would look pretty naked. So yeah, I, I understand if we have to take one out for a driveway, that you know that makes sense. But I don't. I just want to make sure we're not losing all the street mm, trees all no. at once. Any questions? No more questions. I'm done. I think we should take public comment. I do too. Certainly after people have waited this long to comment, we would like them to come forward and speak. So at this time, we will take public comment from anyone wishing to speak on this particular agendized item. We'll start with the comment cards, please. Keith Stevens, West Grandview. My main concerns with the the school is back in 2010, 
uh, the multi-purpose building was put on the agenda and we for years and years have looked forward to it specifically for uh, helping to contain the noise of the outdoor athletics also i think you know that we're looking at a 105 degree weather here next week that it also is for the benefit of the students that they do have an indoor uh, protected place to go to um, and the other reason is that we are very affected by having the the current playground and activities in the Mitchell and the Grandview corner and uh, again it's been our expectation for years that that this is going to be taken care of so the portable classrooms were put exactly on the footprint of the multi-purpose building which automatically puts it to the back of the line and so I'd like to request that it be put back to the front of the line that the existing permits be executed before uh, embarking on this we're going to be looking at years of construction it took almost three years to build the, the athletic field and so now we're going to have the uh, additional construction noise so another suggestion would be to suspend the villa cup during the construction of these buildings is uh, again because it's just more cumulative noise and also give incentive to have the project be done on time thank you thank you Lisa Paleo, West Highland, and then Cynthia Swinka. Hi again, Lisa Paleo, 672 West Highland. Uh, this is the first the community has heard about the removal of the pine tree on the parkway, and I don't think they're going to be happy about that. So I uh, think you might want to let the neighbors know that uh, they're going to be removing one of our trees on city property. Uh, secondly, in terms of trees, uh, the CUP says nothing about removing protected trees, but yet there was a slide today that said two oak trees were going to be removed. Again, the community has no idea that they're going to remove two oak trees because we just noticed it today. Uh, my second point is neighborhood meetings. Invitations are sporadic and last minute. Meetings are at 6 p.m. and impossible for working families to attend. At least one meeting was on a Monday with little advance notice. Alverno continues to make excuses why the neighbors aren't invited. And I don't understand why they can't figure out, figure out the addresses when we give them our contact information every time we see them. I have lived in my home and owned that home for 25 years, and I have yet to receive a letter in the mail from Alverno, and they know where I live. There is no dialogue during these meetings. Alverno speaks at us, and we listen. We then have five minutes to voice our concerns, and they are written down, and there is no discussion or follow-up. Many neighbors, including myself, have stopped going to these meetings because they're absolutely worth worthless. The first meeting that was scheduled on January 24th implied that we were going to talk about traffic, uh, filming, and via rental, rentals. But then they decided to present their expansion plans, and we were absolutely in shock that they did this. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Swenko Wilson, and then... Kristen Stevens. I was just going to speak on the first TUP, so I didn't have a statement for this part. Thank you. Kristen Stevens, West Grandview Avenue. Good evening. Unfortunately, I spent a lot of time on the noise studies and getting that uh, a consultant, so I have not been able to print out this. We disagree with any use of the CDSA noise studies for the Alverno Master Plan in its current form as explained in the peer review documents by MD Acoustics. Any noise conditions in its currently suggested form would be derived from data skewed to benefit Alverno. The studies do not address the neighbor's concerns and complaints nor capture what we experience. It is based on faulty data and it would be fraudulent to continue going forward without correction. We noticed that Alverno tonight only references sports fields, sports, soft sport fields. The noise from sports coming from the parking lot are being ignored while it's being used by hundreds of students on the hardscape Mitchell Linda parking lot. The noise measurements on Grandview are not even pro on the property plane like elsewhere and almost four homes away from the parking lot. There is no current acceptable study in Alverno's application that addresses the levels of noise from well over an acre of hardscape surface. Noise levels were, negative to, were so negative 
relatively impactful to such a degree that the city required the multi-purpose building doors to be shut during its use. Now explain to me how this parking lot is less noise than that. It just makes no sense. I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm so sick of the noise from the last two years. They've been a little quiet suspiciously for the last two weeks, but I guess that's because they haven't had as many students on the lot. But after school, it's going on and we don't want it. After two years, we're still asking for you to address this. It's profound and it's noisy. It's impactful on our health, our lives. Um, in the 2011 page seven noise mitigation measures, it said it was to address issues for the residents of Sierra Madre and Pasadena. At that time, you guys actually took consideration for the, the neighbors on um, Pasadena side, and I think that was pretty cool. In the 2010 report summary, master planners representing Alverno revert, reviewed alternate locations for the sport field, found the impacts were greater than these alternative locations. The planners reviewed the plans, turning the field this way, that way, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna try and run through this. They concluded from these studies that the public interest, convenience, and necessity are better served with the expansion of the soccer softball field in the proposed location, not the northwest corner. Other sites were alternatively, con alternatively considered. I was at those meetings. They said it was, there was too much traffic, too much tree loss, and it was too noisy. The Sierra Madre's uh, master plan definition of noise says any sound that is undesirable becomes because it interferes with speech and hearing or is intensive enough to damage hearing or is otherwise annoying. S noise simply is unwanted sound. We're asking the city to stop this usage of the parking lot. We can't wait 11 more years for this multi-purpose building to be built. It's ridiculous. We attended those meetings. There's no way to mitigate a hardscape sports field. Planting a few trees does nothing. They've taken out so many beautiful trees, but I can't speak to that right now. The quality of our life has been negatively, so negatively intruded upon since Alverna's <coughs> use of the parking lot as their K through eight school for all kinds of use. There are other places to have their lunches. The playground wasn't properly studied. The use of the parking lot um, for classrooms, PE, after school sports. Um, I can play you another few snippets of what it's like just to listen to the coaches and the kids. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. Kids are very loud. The pitch of a sports whistle is 120 decibels. Do you know how many times I've been trying to help a family with a learning disabled student and I'm interrupted in my thought that I cannot help this family because I'm discombobulated? It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that we are finding out it's gonna cost us $200,000 to retrofit our beautiful home when we can't use things like our porch, we can't use our front yard, we can't even use the backyard. Um, I will provide you that page seven, but I think there's something wrong when these studies are saying that it's less noisy and that they don't need to mitigate or deal with the issue on the parking lot. We have sent the Planning Commission, the City Council, our request and our issues about why it's a problem for us we have contacted this um, Alverno, and when we asked at the meeting, the one thing we really asked and wanted was, please, can we stop the use of the parking lot? And we were told, no. No discussion, no mitigation, no, well, let's work it out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let's get them off the parking lot. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? I didn't see, is there a yellow card or a blue card? You can just come out. Um, my name's Jason Dill. I live on Holdman Avenue, so away from Alverno, but we're new to uh, Alverno this year. I have two small girls attending TK and first grade there. My first planning commission meeting, I've watched everyone for the past three years, so I feel relatively up to date on what's happening. Um, <laughs> It's been enlightening now being a participating parent at the school and seeing the traffic and all of the issues which I relate to. On Holdman, I live very close to Sierra Madre Middle School. I can tell you I do not drive down Sierra Madre Boulevard, Cannon, Holdman, when I know that it's drop off or pick up time for the middle school because traffic's bad. Kids are dropped off in the middle of the street on Cannon and I forget, is it uh, the Highland that dead ends into it? It's kind of crazy when you go up there. 
So very similar at Sierra Madre Elementary. You just avoid those intersections. You don't drive up Santa Anita Avenue when Highland Oaks is getting out because there's a line of 200 cars all the way down Santa Anita Boulevard. So this is a product of not just Alverno, it's every school in the community. And the schools are there for the future of our children. And as having small children, I hope that they're welcome in this community and have a future here. Um, I used to live on Sycamore, which is north of Grandview where the Big Dip is. Every single time there was a game at Heasley Field, I could almost tell you what the umpires were saying. And as the crow flies, that's probably over half a mile away. We never complained to the city. There's neighbors that back up to Heasley Field. I don't see public hearings about noise from the constant activities that happen there late into the evening as well. Um, as far as trees being removed, I agree that people should be noticed. I think that we should probably raise a bigger stink about trees that are taken out of our parks than one tree that's creating traffic concerns on a street coming out of that gate south onto Highland. Even if you're going right to look left, the view is very obstructed from that tree, having done it the past three mornings. But we have a tree coming out in Sierra Vista Park for the new playground. That's a very large tree that I know the mayor's not too happy about coming out either based off his comments. There was three trees taken out for the additional parking spots in that park as well, and no sign of how that was mitigated. So as far as trees coming out, like. There was also, I think, three large trees removed on Highland to repair sidewalks and curbs that were damaged there as well. So I think from my sense of being an outsider looking at this, never being involved, I don't live next door, I'm new to the school community, it does seem like tensions are very high and there's a lot of history there. And I hope that the team from Alverno and the neighbors can come together as a community and find some way to work through this. And ending on the note, I know everybody says this, but I have the utmost respect for what you guys do and sit here and listen to and delegate. And it's 11 o'clock at night. So as somebody that's never been here, I just want to say thank you for that. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> Before 11. Before 11. <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like to give public comment at this time? All right. Um, I did have a question about the presentation that was given from the noise engineer. If I could just ask you to come back up for an, a minute. Um, I think that the city code is 70 decibels. And so what's in the general plan isn't codified. It's just guidelines or targets, right? So it doesn't really apply to what the code reflects. So I, I'm not aware of that 80 decibel uh, rule in the general plan. I'll have to go look that up. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the general plan, the, the code has to be consistent with the general plan. And if it's not, the general plan generally trumps the code. So it, it's something I'll have to go back and look at. And I can report back at the next meeting. OK. Um, regardless of that, as I'm looking at I, the CSDA report is yours, right? Yes, correct. OK. This, uh, the one hour intervals have times recorded at 100 decibels and 90 decibels. And so I guess. Help Sorry. me understand why we'll, why, so if I'm looking at page 11 of 22 of your report. Do we bring that up on the screen just so everyone else can? Probably not. Okay. Uh, it's figure nine, continuous noise levels. If you have a copy of your I don't report. have a copy. Do you don't have a copy of your report? Yeah. I'm happy to share this with you. Oh, I thought you got it right there. <sighs> So there's four charts here, and every one of the four charts has readings well above the 80 decibel level. So figure nine on Highland, correct? Figure seven has them up to 90, 
and it appears to be 88 and 88. Figure. Does eight. the are you talking about uh, from March 2nd, correct? This is the Wilson Street CSDA 2021. Figure seven, continuous noise levels at measurement number one. It's page oh, we may be 22. Looking, yeah, I think we're looking at different different versions. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Do you have a copy of this that I can share with him? Why don't you come, come up? Just yeah. take a look at this and you can. Friends. Yeah, okay. You'll have to go back to the microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Understand. All right. So, <laughs> I, we can't really uh, transpose this onto the screen. The graph that you're looking at here has three different noise levels. Continuous noise monitoring, which we call an LEQ, so it's just constantly monitoring minute by minute, hour by hour. We also include it in the orange line, which is the line that you're referencing, what we call the L max. That is the peak noise level within that time frame. That noise level could be caused by an ambulance, could be caused by tons of kids screaming at some point, could be caused by traffic noise exceeding. So it's unclear what that L max is. We wanted to demonstrate what the max noise level is, what the continuous averaging is over the hour, and what the minimum is over the hour. So that's what that's what it's showing here. So it, it's not saying that for the hour, and I'm going to point to one, and I apologize. I know people can't see over my shoulder. It's not saying the noise level was 90 decibels at 8 AM. It's saying that the max noise level from 8 AM to 9 AM at some point in that hourly interval did go up to that noise. It did go up to 90. For how long and what it was caused by is not included in this. And that's normal. Those fluctuations in noise are, are normal for any neighborhood. You're going to have noise levels that max out at various intervals at certain times of the day. But, you know, you've got pick up and drop off times. If you were to take a noise reading and just pick out the max noise level, you'd have a very high noise level. Those are pretty normal things. So uh, a, a, a local resident, when, when they bring us a recording, of what's going on, what they hear, mm -hmm. is what you're saying is that that only represents the one incident inside that hour that where it exceeded whatever. The challenge in having recordings presented is that it's unclear how the recording was taken, whether it's on an iPad, an iPhone, an Android, Right. What's the microphone that's being used? Where was the person standing? How are they orienting the device in order to take the recording? Additionally, the playback is also something that has to be explained. Some devices, when playing recordings back, will auto-gain the recording. So um, for those that use Spotify, there's a setting in Spotify that you can turn on so that all music you listen to will be played back at the same volume once you set it. That way, you don't have one song that blares in your ears and one song that goes really quiet. Right? So playback also becomes an issue. So it's hard to judge noise level just based off of a recording. So the, the residents that are adjacent to the school hear large, loud lo noises for a little while and then not so much. So it's, it's not consistent. And your graphs show the, the minimum of what it was, what the average was, and then what the peaks were. Correct. I'm not here to say that they're not hearing noise. I'm here to show that what we found in digging into the noise code and the general plan is that there wasn't anything clear to state what the maximum is, what the criteria is. So what we found was the 80 dBA criteria and what we wanted to show was that it was below that. If this council finds that that's not an appropriate criteria, absolutely we'll go back and reanalyze based on what we think is an appropriate criteria. During the times that we did measure, there was activity in the parking lot on the hardscape, there was activity on the softscape as well. So we did capture all of that in our measurements. So 
but we did not skew the results or try and omit anything of that nature. No, and I don't think anybody was saying anything about that. I think we were trying to understand when we see readings that are that high, what that means. And of you course. did a great job of explaining it, that those are the, the maximums, and that the number that would likely be a more useful number would be the average. The black line, the, what they call the LEQ. Yes. Correct. OK. Thank you. I, I'd just like to add that the spikes can't be underestimated. They're like emotional triggers. They are can be daggers to one's you know sensibilities. I think, due to the hour and the fact that we have some things that need to go back and be discussed between staff and the applicant, that it's probably best to continue this. Can we? Um but to ask a couple more questions before we continue. Yes, I I I would like to ask the applicant if they could address the phasing. We we had some discussion of phasing, um, it, but not not all of us were here uh, ten years ago. <laughs> um, and so, if you could give us a little understanding of that, especially um, when the multi-purpose room is planned to be constructed, because that seemed to be a big issue for some of the neighbors. The, um, the phasing plan in 2011 provided the school with flexibility um, because funding these facilities is a major lift. Uh -huh. I think at the time the multi-purpose building was in the range of four to five million dollars. You know, it's a, a very significant amount. The athletic field was 2.7 million dollars to give you an estimation. That was a couple of years ago and that was originally estimated about 1.2. So. You know, I don't know what the inflation, construction inflation factor would be over the last 12 years for the, what the multipurpose building would cost now, but I would imagine it's in maybe the $7 million range. So the city recognized that, the planning commission recognized it, that, you know, basically the phasing plan should have some flexibility to allow the school to do capital campaigns, apply for grants, whatever, you know, funding mechanisms we could come up with. It did say in order to uh, lock in your approval you needed to do phase one and phase one was basically the installation of all the view fencing and landscaping on Mitchell Linda and then the um, DG path and all the landscaping on Grandview and we had to do that within a one-year period so that's what the original master plan if you go back and take a look at it now how the directors arrange this now is it basically phasing is flexible for us I mean we've got more projects now big and small than we had at the 2011 master plan. We've got an art classroom that's 1,200 square feet, small project. We have a renovation of the caretaker's facility for a flexible space. There's a, a tear down of a f demolition of a, the faculty lounge and uh, faculty office, business office and construction of parking lot, all the way up to the multi-purpose building. So the resolution was written in such a way that basically uh, to within the next five years, we basically have to pick a phase, an improvement, and we're gonna to have to do that in order to basically um, lock in the conditional use permit. That's how I read it. And so it's basically based on all, basically lower school, I don't know, if Vincent, if with the multi-purpose building is in there, but I, I think it's least, it has all of those major improvements. We'd have to go back and look at the resolution. But the phasing for us has to be flexible. I mean, I know the, the um, the neighbors would like to see the multi-purpose building constructed, but even when the multi-purpose building is constructed, there's still a need on the campus for outdoor activities. That's just the way it's going to be. They don't like to hear that, but we have to be honest with them, and we have to be honest with you and tell you the truth that if we built a multi-purpose building, there's still going to be need for space outdoor for outdoor activities. Won't that be handled by the two fields that are down by Wilson, uh, down by uh, Highland? My understanding is that it won't, but I can let let Julia come up and talk about it and we, we, just go to the microphone. Yeah, because we we do we are a TK through 12 school, so um, the lower school uh, they use hardscapes outside to play, which is why we have a sports court. And if you look at the if you look 
at the uh, master plan, there's a sports court for the kids so that we have a place for them to play in the new school um, area. And so, but that doesn't mean that um, that upper area may not still be used by students. Um, it is, you know, if, if show me a school that doesn't use its, its parking lot as a playground when you have small kids. It's, it's you know, it, it does double duty. And so um, it's kind of how it is with small kids because the high school students would need to use the, the gym most of the time. And that's, that's the reality. Any additional questions on phasing? No, I, I, I guess the, the concern is, you know, if, if, you, if you tell a neighbor that, look, you have to lump this for a short period of time, maybe even a year or two um, until we, we fix the issue, that's one thing. It's another thing to say, uh, we don't know when this is going to get fixed or it's just never going to get fixed. And so I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I understand your point that y you have to raise money and you can build when that money comes in, but I think the other side of it is, if, if this is something that's going to, to be a, a long-term issue or a potentially long-term issue, then it, the need for it to be addressed otherwise is heightened compared to if it's, oh, don't worry, we're gonna fix this in a year and we can all just sort of suffer for a while. Um, so I, I think that's something we need to think about a little bit more about if, if this uh, sort of hardscape noise in the, the northwest quadrant is going to persist for a long time, maybe there's some ways we can mitigate that by moving it, some of the activities or doing some other kind of, um, some other factors to, to, to mitigate that. I'm not sure what they would be, but it, it sounds like what we're talking about is a longer term issue than just a short term issue. Yeah. Oh, don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, it, it kind of dovetails from phasing. So as we think about construction, because inevitably, inevitably there will be construction, um, filming and construction don't exactly go hand in hand. And so how will we be assured that you won't put construction on hold in order to do filming projects? Well, the, go, you want to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, if you stop and think about where the villa is located and the, and the field, <laughs> imagine what it was like trying to do, have any kind of filming during the time of that, fil that field being constructed because there was dirt, there were those things going all day long with the beep, 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 and in the noise that they made, and it was very, ex it was extremely loud. It did affect filming. But what was affected was the filming. It wasn't the construction, because we needed to get the construction finished. So you know, on days that it, we we had to work around it, it's that you know, it's they would have to tell the construction everybody quiet for what, give us 15 minutes while we film this, and they would stop there and you know, they'd go take a break. But other than that, it wasn't it, it filming was you know affected not construction with our with, with our construction contracts we always put in basically a timeline and the contractor has to perform you know based on the timeline so what happens if, if we delay a project let's say we now we have film and we ask the contractor to basically stop for a week or two weeks or whatever we then get into a point where we're you know we're paying penalties to that contractor so you know, I don't know how realistic the question is in terms of, you know, how, how can we assure that you're not going to stop construction because of filming? I mean, from a practical standpoint, it's, you know, from a contractual standpoint, it, the penalties accrue to the school when we do something like that. But I think it does speak to the intensity of the use for the, of, the, of the property. Yes. And it's one, more, it's one more thing that generates, you know, activity that's going to bump up against your neighbors and everything else. Not all filming is that intense. There's a whole range of type of filming. Yeah. 
Anything else? Anybody have anything else that they would like answers brought back for for our next meeting? Well, I, I think I already mentioned the the you know thinking about how we can address the 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 hard surface noise in the northwest. I think that's that's a big issue because it seems like that's going to be around a while. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing, and then obviously the seismic thing that that you raised as well. All right, then would you prefer to come back at a date certain? Yeah, again, uh, if you wanted to schedule us for October 6th, that would be fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hopefully the uh, CUP on the villa will be pretty straightforward and you can go, the commission can read it and yeah, maybe and we can do it questions. tonight if you like it the way it is. Excuse me? <laughs> we can do it tonight if you like it the way it is. Uh, well, we just had one condition we have to work on. Yeah. <laughs> Director, does that, does that date work for us? Yeah, it does. All right. So I, I would love a motion for continuance to a date certain of October 6th. I'll move that we move. move. <laughs> <laughs> to a uh, date certain of October 6th. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Planning Commission reports. I have none. Hearing none, Planning and Community Preservation Department reports. So I am asking the Planning Commission to cancel their September 15th meeting. And at that time, the City Council will take that Thursday slot at 5.30 for a special meeting uh, regarding the Meadows of Bailey Canyon specific plan project. I thought we had two meetings off. Just one. This is the first meeting of, no. Yeah. We, we have, used to have yeah. two meetings off. Um, well, we were, that's just anticipating. But what we're going to be doing is going back to a regular meeting of the City Council uh, which is a requirement if we're going to adopt ordinances uh, for that same project. So they took away our, our day. Yeah. Our, you're back on October 6th. Once again. All right. So do you need a motion for that? I'd prefer one, yes. Would anybody like to move to take? Yeah, come on, Bill. <laughs> uh, so what exactly. was the date? <laughs> Director, that was September 15th. September 15th. What's the motion again? We're, we're uh, alleviating to, our... To uh, <laughs> cancel our regularly scheduled okay, September 15th meeting. All right. I, I move that we cancel our regularly scheduled September 15th uh, meeting and move it to October 6th. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries unanimous. All right. Anything else, Director? I will adjourn this meeting. All right. <laughs> <laughs>